VPN and Sir, how are you, sir? Uh, not too bad. Do not be angry. She is not here yet, so I'm sure. Yeah, we will. It's all good. Thanks, sir. I came back here and wrote some stuff up. Make sure I have everything there. I would have been physically ill had I not come back and made notes and did some other stuff. You get that? Yeah. Yeah, he showed you through and uh, uh, whatever exhibit that uh, he gave us an actual like PowerPoint of it, which is the same yeah. thing. I actually made a copy for. Uh, Here's this.
I know, I know. I'm working at Walmart. Could be a greeter.
Present. Mr. Parker, Mr. Nash's lawyers, the state of Ohio is represented by Mr. Junk, Ms. Kanepa, and Mr. Wilson. Also uh, present is Mr. Scheider, or Agent Scheider of Ohio BCI and I. Yesterday, when we uh, adjourned for the evening, Michael Kazar was on the uh, witness stand, Agent Kazar. Um, is counsel for each side ready to have the jury brought in? Yes. yes sir. Maybe we could have uh, <coughs> Agent Kazar could have, be seated in the jury or in the witness chair. Thank you. You can bring the jury in. seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good to see you all here today. You'll recall that when we adjourned for the evening yesterday, that uh, Agent Kazar was here in the witness chair where he is now, and the state was conducting direct examination. Is the state ready to continue its direct examination? Yes, Your Honor. Thank is, you. is the defense ready? Yes. All right, and Agent Kajar, I would just remind you that you that the oath that was ministered yesterday is still in effect. Still yes, in effect. sir. The state may examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Agent Kajar, I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes again as State's Exhibit Triple C One. Can you just take a look at that, and just so we're all back on the same sheet of music? Can you tell the jury what we're looking at there with? Respect to State's Exhibit Triple C One. Yes, sir. This is the uh, list of bank accounts and credit cards and loans uh, that I looked at that were uh, relevant to our investigation. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes. At State's Exhibit Triple C Two. State's Exhibit Triple C Two. Again, can you tell the jury or refresh the jury's recollection with respect to what is State's Exhibit Triple C2? Yes, sir. So this is the list of uh, purchases that I identified as being relevant to the investigation. Okay. Can you do me a favor? Can you put both State's Exhibit Triple C1 and Triple C2 just kind of up there because I'm going to ask you to refer to them as we work our way through this process, okay? Yes, sir. Now... I put an image up on the screen there. Can you see it? Yep. 
And with respect to the image on the screen, is that uh, contained in State's Exhibit Triple C One? Yes. And yesterday we were just starting to work our way through uh, this document. With respect to State's Exhibit Triple C One, as part of your work in this case, did you analyze uh, various financial transactions and um, accounts related to credit cards or loans? Uh, with respect to the four suspects, defendants in this case? Yes, I did. Okay. And if you could, I want to walk through each one of those uh, on, the, on the list. As part of your work in this case, did you analyze a, uh, the records of a, a Bank of America Bass Pro Shops card? I did. And can you tell us uh, the information about uh, that account? Sure. It was a, it's a credit card. Um, the last four digits on that card is 4298. Um, it's in the name of Jake Wagner, and he's the sole signer on that card. It was opened in December 10th, 2013, uh, closed March 18th, 2018. I'm sorry, opened uh, December 10th, 2013, closed March 18th, 2018. And uh, for the purposes of my review, I looked at uh, the entire period that the card was open from open to close. As part of your, well, with respect to that count, other than Jake Wagner, were there any other signers or owners of that credit card? No. Did you also, as part of your work in this case, uh, review uh, documents or an account associated with a, an auto loan in the name of Jake Wagner from First State Bank? I did. Can you tell us the information about that account? So that was uh, with First State Bank. Uh, the account number was 2320. It was in the name of Jake Wagner. It was opened October 20th, 2015. It closed January 4th of 2016. And I reviewed the statements from the open date through the close date, as well as the application, the loan application material. With respect to that loan or that account, were there any other owners are co-signers on that loan? No. Did you also, as part of your work in this case, review documents associated with a loan from First State Bank uh, with the account number 3739 that was to George Wagner? That's correct. Can you tell us the information about that account? Yes, so that was an auto loan. Uh, the, the account number was 3739. It was uh, opened by uh, George Wagner. He was the only signer. And um, it was opened on January 11th, 2017, closed March 13th, 2017. And for my review, I reviewed the, the entire period, all of the statements, the payments, and uh, as well as the application materials. Did you review documents associated with another loan from the same bank to George Wagner uh, with the account number ending in 3696? I did. Again, can you give us the information associated with that account? Yes, so that was with the same bank, First State Bank. It was uh, in the name of George Wagner. It was opened December 28th, uh, 2016, closed March 13th, 2017. And from my review, I reviewed the statements for the entire period as well as the application materials for the loan. As part of your work, did you also review the documents or review documents associated with another loan that was associated with George Wagner and Tabitha Wagner from that same bank. I did. Can you tell us the information about that? Yes, so that this, this loan was an auto loan, account number 2161. It was, uh, the signers on the loan were George Wagner and Tabitha Wagner. The loan was opened September 2nd, 2015, closed December 30th, 2016, I looked at uh, all, all of the statements for the entire period that that loan was open. Did you also review documents from or associated with another loan from First State Bank that was a home equity line of credit? Yes. Can you tell us the information about that account? Sure. So that was a home equity loan. The account number was 7100209. It was in the name of Jake Wagner. It was opened on January, I'm sorry, July 21st of 2015, 
closed March 15th, 2017. And I looked at the complete period that it was open. Did you review records associated with the Capital One Cabela's card in this case? I did. Can you give us the information associated with that account? Yes, yeah, so this was a um, credit card. It ended in the digits of 4543. The data was opened was August 30th, 2013. It was closed September 14th, 2017. And I reviewed the entire period that the card was opened, all of the transactions, payments, et cetera, as well as the documents used to open up that credit card. With respect to that Cabela's card, were there any other co-signers on that account? No. Did you also, in the course of your duties there, or your work in this case, review uh, several different loans from she Sheffield Financial? I did. Can you go ahead and just walk through each one of those loans from Sheffield and give us the information associated with that? Okay. Yes, yeah, so there were, there were three loans from Sheffield Financial. Um, the first was uh, through Planet Power Sports. It was a uh, ending digits in that loan was 7637. It was an installment loan. Uh, it was, the loan was made to George Wagner. So this would be for an equipment or ATV or trailer purchase, something like that. The date it was opened was November 20th, 2012. It was closed uh, July 23rd, 2015. And uh, for the investigation, I reviewed the entire period as well as the application materials. Uh, the second loan from Sheffield Financial uh, was made through ASK Power Sports. This loan uh, ended in, uh, the account number ended in 9468. It was just like the other one was an installment loan. This loan was made out to Jake Wagner. The date it was opened was January 5th, 2013, closed July 3rd, 2015. And I reviewed the entire period that it was under, that it was open. The third Sheffield Financial uh, loan was made through Frontier Trailer Sales, ending digits 4233. It was an installment loan uh, made out to George. Data was opened was March 8th, 2018 closed July 31st, 2019, and I reviewed the entire period that okay. it was open. And finally, as part of your work with respect to credit card accounts and loans, did you have the opportunity to review a credit card account associated with Tabitha Wagner? I did. And can you give us the information about that account? Yes, so that was a fifth third account. Uh, it was a credit card ending in 2604 uh, in the name of Tabitha Wagner. It was opened December, 21st, 2013, closed October 23rd, 2014, and I reviewed all of the transactions that went through that card. Okay. You talked about how with some of those credit card accounts, you did a deep, deep dive or, or reviewed all of the transactions. Is that correct? That's correct. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit Triple C11. State's Exhibit Triple C11, can you take a look at that? Do uh, you recognize that document? I do. Can you tell the jury what that is? So this is um, basically I cataloged all of the transactions for a Bank of America credit card ending in 4298. This is the credit card that was uh, the Bass Pro Shops card issued through Bank of America in the name of Jake Wagner. And again, with respect to that card there, uh, were there any other signers on that card other than Jake Wagner? No. Mr. John, can I get the next slide? As you reviewed the financial tra transactions associated with that account, uh, were there several different transactions that, uh, that drew your attention? Yes. Okay. First, I'm going to direct your attention to a transaction that took place on March 17, 2016. March 17, 2016, as you review those records, what, let me know when you're there, first of all, in, in that exhibit. Yeah. Okay. 
in those records on March 17, 2016, do you see a transaction uh, for a Walmart in West Union in the amount of $463.29? Yes. Yes. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit CC71. Yes. State's Exhibit CC71. Can you take a look at that for me? And can you tell us what appears to be depicted in State's Exhibit CC71? This appears to be the receipt associated with that purchase. Your Honor, I'm not going to put this up on PowerPoint, but can I publish it for the jury? Objection, Mr. Can we see it? Yeah. It's CC, CC, not triple C. CC71. Any objections from the No, Yes. For, for the record, just to clear it up. The CC exhibits are the exhibits that are associated with the search of state documents. All right, I'm going to hand you State's Exhibit CC71. State's Exhibit CC71 that you have in, there, in your hand there. Again, do you see a, a date and a time and a location of that Walmart that links it to a transaction in the exhibit that you have in front of you? Yes. Okay. And do you see on State's Exhibit CC71... A, a purchase of a, a, a camera kit for $299. I do. And associated with that a purchase, do you also see a purchase of a three-year service plan for $28? I do. Okay. Now, with respect to that exhibit, uh, do you see where a credit card was attempted to be used a couple of times and was declined? I do. And can you tell us uh, the credit card that was declined, uh, does that receipt have the last four numbers of that credit card account? Yes. Okay, and what are those? So it's 4543. Four, and if I could direct your attention to State's Exhibit Triple C1. State's Exhibit Triple C1, again, is there a credit card listed in those accounts? that you reviewed that has the last four of uh, 4543? Yes, that is the Cabela's Capital One card uh, in the name of George Wagner. So that card was declined twice, is that correct? Yes, two times. Uh, looks like 9.19 uh, p.m. and 9.20 p.m. And then was another card used that was actually accepted? Yes, the, the third attempt at payment on this was accepted, and that was the uh, Bass Pro Shop credit card for 298. And who is that Bass Pro Shop credit card linked to? Uh, Jake Wagner. And again, with respect to the financial records that you have, for Jake Wagner's credit card, does it appear that that transaction actually went through? Yes, it did go through. I'd like to direct your attention again in those records to another purchase uh, on March 27, 2016 from Bass Pro Shops. If you could, uh, let me know when you're there. Yes. Okay. Can you give us the specifics with respect to that purchase and whether or not that purchase is present in uh, Jake Wagner's Bass Pro Shop credit card records. Yes, it was. Okay. And when was that purchase? Where was it? How much was it for? So the, the purchase was uh, March 27th, 2016 um, at Bass Pro Shops. The total amount was $184.77 and it was in uh, Cincinnati. As part of your work in this case, were you able to link that purchase to items of interest that are annotated on State's Exhibit Triple C2? I was. Okay. And can you tell us what items of interest were purchased with that credit card on that date? Uh, there, there were two items of interest. 
associated with that purchase. Okay. The first? The first was uh, ammunition, and the second was uh, a magazine. Okay. So, more specifically, is the type of ammunition annotated as the item of interest? It is. And can you read that to me exactly? Please? Yes. It is. The manufacturer is Tool, T, tool Ammo, T U L A M M O. Uh, the caliber, it's a 7.62 by 39. And uh, the boxes were, I think the grain would be 154 grain, and it 40 rounds of ammo in each box, and there were two, two boxes purchased. You said there was a magazine purchased also at that uh, same time or as part of that same transaction, is that correct? That's correct. And can you tell us, are there any specifics about that magazine? Yes, uh, the manufacturer of the magazine was SKS. And just to be clear, this is a magazine like a magazine used to hold bullets, not like a magazine that you read. Okay. Um, manufacturer was SKS. Uh, it's a 30 round magazine. Uh, the caliber holds a 7.62 by 39 millimeter. Okay. Let me jump in real quick. Are you, oh, go ahead. Are you done reading? Go ahead. And it was just, it was a single magazine that was purchased. Okay. Was there a price associated with it? Yes. It was $26.99. And I think you testified yesterday that you're not really a gun guy, right? No, I mean, I know a little bit, okay. but I'm by no means an expert with firearms. So would you say manufacturers SKS? Do you know if that's the manufacturer? Does it say manufacturer, or does it just say SKS? It just says SKS. Thank you. I'm assuming that's the manufacturer, but okay. but you're not a gun guy, right? Correct. Okay. We have people for that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now let me ask you this: based on your knowledge, your training, your experience, do you know whether or not if you use a uh, like a Bass Pro credit card? Mm -hmm. actually at the Bass Pro shop. Yes. Do you get extra points or some kind of discount for using their credit card at their shop? Uh, yes. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit Triple C 13. And I'll take Triple C 11 from you. State's Exhibit Triple C 13. Do you recognize that? I do. Can you tell the jury what that is, please? So this is um, my, basically I categorized all of the transactions that uh, were run through the credit card uh, with the ending digits 4543. Mr. Judge, can you give me the next slide? I'm putting an image up on the screen for you. And again, do you recognize the heading or the, the title as being reflective of that account associated with that credit card, 4543. Yeah, that's accurate. It's a Capital One credit card um, that's branded Cabela's, and uh, it's in the norm name of George Wagner. With respect to your work in this case, again, did you have the opportunity to go through the transactions associated with that credit card for any specific transaction? Uh, that may have evidentiary value. I did. I want to direct your attention to March of 2016. Could you go ahead and take a second? there a transaction from March 18, 2016 uh, with respect to Brickhouse Electronics in those records of George Wagner's credit card? There is. Okay. And could you give us the specifics in his records of those, uh, of, that of that transaction? Yes. So the posting date on that transaction was March 18, 2016. Uh, the retailer was Brickhouse Electronics. Um, and I believe they're out of New York, and the total amount was $244.94. And through the investigation, was that transaction on George Wagner's credit card linked to an item of interest uh, that may have evidentiary value? Yes, it was. Okay, and again, could you go to Triple C2 
and tell us specifically with respect to that transaction on George Wagner's credit card, what item of interest was purchased? Sure. So we issued a subpoena to Brickhouse um, Electronics to receive to get the detail on what actually was purchased. So the actual purchase date was March 16th, 2016. Um, as we discussed yesterday, sometimes the posting date is different from the actual purchase date just because it takes time for the transaction to make its way through the electronic system. Uh, in this case, there was uh, one item that was purchased. It was a personal multi-bug detector. Okay. Did you also uh, find a transaction from March 21st, 2016 that was linked to an international purchase from China? Yes. Okay. And could you walk us through the specifics of that purchase? So that purchase uh, posted on March 21st, 2016. The retailer was HK Trading Company uh, out of China and um, for $630.59. And with respect to that purchase, was there a foreign transaction fee associated with that purchase? There was. Okay. And can you tell us what is a foreign transaction fee and how does that get attached to your credit card? Or? Yeah, so that's something that's assessed by the credit card itself, uh, the credit card company, the bank. Okay. Um, basically, it's a, it's a fee to um, kind of for facilitating that transaction. I guess there's certain costs to them when you go, when you make a purchase in, in another currency. So that's just a fee that they assess. Um, the fee, and it's not, like, in this case, it was $6.31. So it's not like a round, it's, it's a different, it's based on the amount of the transaction. Okay. Now, with respect to that March 18th purchase from Brickhouse Electronics that was in New York, you testified that you were able to send a subpoena to find out what that actually was or what that item actually was. That's correct. correct. With respect to uh, the item that was purchased from China, uh, there at BCI, do you have much luck getting China to comply with a uh, subpoena request from the United States? No, China, China does not honor our subpoenas. So as a result, with respect to this item, uh, were you ever able to determine specifically uh, records associated with that? No. Okay. With respect to both of those items, the March 18, 2016 purchase from Brickhouse and the March 21st, 2016 purchase uh, from the Chinese company. Can you do me a favor? Can you take a second, um, and you have State's Exhibit Triple C 13, which are George, Re George Wagner's credit card records, his Capital One, or his Cabela's card records. What I want you to do is start with that March 18, 2016 date, Go to the end of those records and look for whether or not either that Brickhouse Electronics purchase or that purchase from that Chinese company were ever credited back to that. Like as, a, as a refund, that as sort a, of thing. As a refund or a, a, a fraudulent purchase. Triple C, 13. No, I'm not seeing any refund for either of those purchases. Okay, so based on the records associated with George Wagner's credit card, he never was refunded for that, those purchases, is that correct? That's correct, so my records go, so these purchases were made in March of 2016. And the records that I looked at went through September of 2017, so about another year and six months. And yeah, there was there was no uh, no refund that I see on this credit card for these these transactions. Okay. And with go back to uh, State Exhibit Triple C one. Mm -hmm. With respect to, you said you looked through all of your subpoenaed records, is that correct? Yes. And with respect to George Wagner's Capital uh, One Cabela's credit card, 
uh, give us the open date and close date. The open date on that account was August 30th, 2013, and okay. the close date was September 14th, 2017. And then your subpoena date? Um, the subpoena covered from December 16th, 2013 through uh, September 14th, 2017. So you're, the, the subpoena of the records that you just testified to covered to the date that that credit card was closed out, is that correct? That's correct. And with respect to the life of that credit card, do you see anything where those two purchases were credited back to that account? No. All right. I want to direct your attention now to an April 13th, 2016 purchase. Um, if you could, in Triple C 13, do you see a uh, purchase from the Waverly R Rural King on April 13th, 2016? I do. Okay. Can you give us the specifics with respect to that purchase? Yes. So that posted um, April 13th, 2016, uh, the retailer was Waverly uh, Rural King. So it was Rural King in Waverly, um, Waverly, Ohio. The total amount of the transaction was $553.81. And based on the investigation, were you able to go through that purchase and determine whether or not there were any items of interest within that $553 purchase? I was. And could you tell us uh, what that was? Yes. So it was a flashlight. It was a uh, 3D uh, flashlight, 32 LEDs, uh, sorted color. <laughs> so I'm not sure what color it was, but. Okay. And again, is that something that you've been directed to look for from other members of the investigative team? Yeah, the investigative team basically told me any flashlights uh, I should call out. I want to move your attention now to April 18th, 2016. Mm -hmm. April 18th, 2016, do you see a purchase? on George Wagner's credit card from OK Auto Parts? I do. Okay. And can you give us the specifics of that purchase? Yes, yeah, so it was April 18th, 2016. Retailer was OK Auto Parts. Uh, they are located, uh, the retail location was in Peebles, Ohio. And the total amount was $90.20. Again, were you able, as part of the investigation, to go through that purchase and see whether or not there was any specific items of interest that you wanted to take note of? There was. Okay, and can you tell the jury uh, what you found in that purchase? Yes, so uh, that purchase was uh, one of the item, of, it was for multiple items, but the in, my item of interest uh, for our investigation here was a uh, Wix filter, heavy duty spin on fuel water separator. Item three three nine six zero. And again, was that an item that you had been directed to pay attention to or to, to look for? Yes. Finally, I want to direct your attention to April twenty seventh, two thousand sixteen. Um, was there a purchase uh, in George Wagner or on George Wagner's Cabela's credit card? on that day from Waverly Rural King? There was. And can you run us through the specifics of that purchase? Yes, so that was uh, April 27, 2016 at the Rural King in Waverly. Uh, the transaction action amount was $130.68. Okay. And again, that was put on George Wagner's credit card on that day That's at that location? That's correct. I'm gonna show you what's been marked for identification purposes. The State's Exhibit CC-294. State's Exhibit CC-294, I pulled a document out from inside. Could you do me a favor, just take a second and read over that. You may have to read over the, the writing uh, as well, the typewriting. Okay. Can you tell us, what, what is that exhibit? So this is a uh, customer checklist from, for the purchase of a firearm. Okay. Does it tell you where that firearm was purchased, or at least what company that firearm was purchased from? Uh, no. All right. I'm not saying that. Read the, read the typewritten portion at the top. Oh, 
You're right. All right. <laughs> Rural King. Okay. And does that document there have a date associated with that? Person? It does. And so what's that it, date? The date is April 27, 2016. And does that have a name associated with the purchaser? For the customer? Yes. Customer. Is George Wagner. And based on your knowledge, your training, your experience, again, when you've had to go and look through different purchases, uh, sometimes you find that people split purchases. Part of a purchase they'll pay in, in cash, and they may buy other items that they pay for with a credit card. Sure, that's always a possibility. It's, it's one of the complications of my job. <laughs> right. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit Triple C 14. And Mr. Junk, you can actually turn that TV off on the other slides. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit Triple C 14. Can you take a look at that? Do you recognize that? I do. And can you tell the jury what that item is? So this is the detail, um, the transactions that I noted uh, for uh, one of the auto loans from First State Bank. And can you tell us uh, the information associated with that loan? What type of vehicle was it for and what were the dates associated with it? Sure. So this one was a, a auto loan through First State Bank. It was account 2320 uh, in the name of Edward Wagner. It was a loan for, uh, it was a loan issued October 20th, 2015 for uh, $16,299.18. It was for a 2009 uh, Dodge Ram 2500. Were there any other signers on that loan that you see? No. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit Triple C 15. State's Exhibit Triple C 15, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, this is um, the detail for a loan issued by First State Bank. Uh, it's the account number 3739. It was also an auto loan issued to George Wagner. And did you give the date associated with it, the type of vehicle? So the loan date was January 11th, 2017. It was for a 2004 uh, Chevy Suburban with the purchase price of $6,000. The total loan amount was $6,670. And again, were there any other co-signers on that one? No. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit Triple C 16. State's Exhibit Triple C 16, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, so this is the detail for uh, another auto loan through First State Bank, uh, account number 3696. Uh, this loan, the loan date was December 28, 2016. Total loan amount was $6,672.57. It was for a 2007 uh, Dodge S35 uh, with a purchase price of $17,000. And uh, it was in the name of George Wagner. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. It's State's Exhibit Triple C 17. State's Exhibit Triple C 17. Can you take a look at that for me? Yes. Can you tell us what that is, please? So this is a, another auto loan. First State Bank account number... 2161, and uh, this loan date was September 2nd, 2015. Uh, the total loan amount was $28,822. The, um, so it was for two vehicles. Uh, one was a 2007 Chevy 2500 and the other was a 2007 Dodge S35. 
purchase price on each was seventeen thousand dollars. If you could look through the loan history uh, associated with that loan, at some point does it appear that there was an insurance payout or that one of those cars was actually towed, one of the vehicles? Yes. Okay, can you tell us about that? Sure. So, uh, on November 14th, 2016, uh, GEICO, the insurance company, made a payout for a total loss on the, uh, it was on the Chevy, the 2007 Chevy 2500. So the Geico made a made a payment to the bank here, sixteen thousand one hundred ninety three dollars. And again, with respect to that loan, were there any other co-signers on that loan? Well, yes, uh, Tabitha Wagner. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State Exhibit Triple C eighteen. State Exhibit Triple C eighteen. Can you tell us what that is? So this is the detail for. The three uh, installment loans that I uh, reviewed that came from Sheffield Financial. And again, as part of your work in this case, uh, did you go through and analyze the, the transactions associated with those loans? I did. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit. Triple C nineteen. State exhibit triple C nineteen. Can you tell us what that is, please? Yeah. So this is the this is the detail uh, of the transactions for a loan from First State Bank, uh, account 7100209. This was a home equity loan for um, a property at 260 Peterson Road in Peebles. And um, this, this is the loan. It was issued uh, July 21st, 2015 and closed March 15th, 2017. And it was in the name of Jake Wagner. And was there, as you analyzed that home equity line of credit, was there a purpose associated with that, that loan? Yes, it was um, specifically for repairs on the property. And if you could take a second and look at that exhibit, Triple C 19. And again, I, I think I just looked in the July 31st at, at the top there. Um, just take a second and look through the first third of that page with respect to transactions. I'm going to ask you a question about it. With respect to that home equity line of credit, do you see transfer payments uh, from that line of credit associated with George Wagner's Cabela's credit card? Uh, yes. Do you also see transfer payments from that home equity line of credit to Jake Wagner's Bass Pro credit card? I do. Right. And that, even though there's transfers to, to George Wagner's Cabela's card, whose name is that in? This loan is in Jake's name. As you analyze the bank records, the credit card records, the loan records, and all of the financial records associated with these four defendants, mm -hmm. the four Wagners, yes. did you notice a, a large number of transfers between accounts belonging to the different individual suspects and defendants? Yes. Okay. Describe that. If you could, just generally generally tell the jury what your observations were. Uh, in general, I mean, there were, there were frequent transfers between the accounts, between the different family members. I think over the period of, you know, really my focus was on a period of around three to three and a half years. And there were over $100,000 worth of, of 
financial transfers between the different accounts and credit cards and that sort of thing. Based on your knowledge, your training, your experience, um, are frequent transfers of money between individuals indicative of anything about the relationships between those victims? Okay. Well, I think you should, there should be more foundation. Okay. Is one of the things, when you, when you review financial records yes. of um, organizations, is, is, is part of what you do in your work there as a forensic accountant, analyze records associated with criminal organizations? Yes. Okay. Do you look for patterns or transfers of uh, financial transactions between different members of the organization? I do. Okay. Why? Frequent transfers of money, sharing of funds, sharing of expenditures shows that uh, even though accounts may be in separate names, what you might be seeing is that they're working as a coordinated group. Based on your observations of the transactions between these four individuals, again, was that consistent with your knowledge on people working together as a coordinated group? He said overruled. You can answer that. It was overruled. You can answer that. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yes. Okay. Did you also, as part of your work in this case, and based on your observation from reviews of these records, did you notice any trends with respect to the way the four defendants shared expenses? I did. I did. Okay. And when you looked at these expenses, or how they, they paid for expenses, was one of the things that you looked at vehicles, who paid for the, the, the vehicles? Yes. Okay. In your review of almost four years worth of, of records, can you tell us which of the four Wagners purchased vehicles for the family? That would be uh, Jake and George. And in your review of, again, these three and a half, four years of, of records, did you see any individual purchases of vehicles by Billy or Angela? No. In your review of these records, did you also look at shared expenses with respect to the purchase of groceries and general retail type items? I did. And can you tell us generally what your observations were? Most of the grocery and general retail purchases were made uh, on bank accounts and credit cards held by George and Jake. Did you also, in your review of patterns or, or how expenses were shared, did you also look at utilities and how utilities were paid? I did. Say it again. I'm going to rule that. And again, as you looked at how utilities were paid for these individuals, or for the group, can you tell us uh, what your observations were? Yes. Uh, generally, the, most of the utilities were paid by George, uh, George and Jake. Utilities are something that I always, in most of my investigations, I really focus on especially where you have a shared living situation, because that really tells you a lot about how the finances are working in that household. Well, it goes beyond the answer to the question, so I will, I will sustain the objection. Order the last part about why he looks at that, be stricken, but uh, the rest of the answer will be about the same. Thank you. You testified about the fact that you reviewed the records with respect to utilities, correct? That's correct. And it is you do your forensic review of an organization's finances, are utilities something that is important for you to look at? Yes. And why? Utilities, especially... 
in a in a shared living situation utilities can tell you a lot about how the finances are working both within a family within an organization a business whatever it is um, you know when you have a situation where it's roommates you'll often see each roommate putting money in together and paying fair share of whatever the utilities are or one of them pays water and one pays electric and another pays gas or something like that when you have situations where you see one person paying all of the utilities it indicates maybe it's not an equal situation financially okay. you talked about shared living um, again did you re review the records, uh, the financial records of these defendants to determine whether or not there was any financial indication of whether these four defendants had actually lived apart from each other uh, during the time of your review. Over. Uh, based on the financial records, they lived together. Okay. During your, your review of these records, was there ever any financial indication that this defendant, George Wagner, lived, paid rent, or paid a mortgage that was apart from Angela or Jake White? No. Based on your review of these financial records, was there ever any financial indication that Jake Wagner lived, paid rent, paid a mortgage that was separate or apart from George or Angela Wagner? No. Based on your review of these records, was there ever any financial indication that Angela Wagner had ever lived, paid rent, or paid a mortgage that was separate or apart from George or Jake Wagner? No. During your review of these records, uh, in your forensic review of this case, did you learn whose name was basically on the deed uh, or mortgage at um, Peterson Road? For Peterson Road? For Peterson Road. Uh, yes. Who's? That would be uh, George and Jake Wagner. During your review of these records, were you able to observe how the different individual Wagners, the different defendants, suspects in this case, were financially connected to each other? Yes. Did your observations with respect to this interconnection show that Jake, George, and Angela were more financially interconnected with each other than they were with Billy? Objection. Well, it, it's a leading question, if nothing else. So okay. Sustain the objection. During your review of these records, did you observe that some defendants, some of the four defendants, were more financially interconnected with each other than others? Yes. Oh, you said four years worth of records. I'll be over with the objection, but the answer so the answer will stand. Okay, so let me re-ask the question. During your review of these records, the records that you testified to that you reviewed in this case, did you observe that some of the four defendants were more financially interconnected with each other than they were with others? Yes. And who was more connected with each other? That would be Angela, Jake, and George. Based on your observations of these records and your review of these records, who was Billy more financially connected with? Over who? Uh, Frederica Wagner. Now, the exhibits that you testified to and the exhibits that I've shown you are they just a summary or a fraction of the actual documents that you looked at in this case? Yes. Okay. And, uh, again, do you have any idea how many documents you reviewed as part of your work in this case? Well, I mean, just detailed here is 17 bank accounts and 11 credit cards and loans. Um, I'd say I looked at, throughout the course of this investigation, probably another between 30 and 50 accounts, the detail in those accounts. So we're talking tens of thousands of pages of bank statements, uh, credit card receipts. Uh, I mean, just the subpoena return from Amazon alone was, was enormous. So um, 
and it's part of my job. I, I need to go through all of that page by page. And is part of your job trying to figure out what is pertinent for the purposes of an investigation? Yes. And again, is part of your job paring that down even more to help decide what is pertinent for the purposes of a presentation in court? That's correct. And did you do that in this case? Yes. I have nothing further to say. The defense may cross examine. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Good morning, Mr. Kazar. Kazar, that's correct. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I was wondering sure I know. That right. It's a difficult name. Yes, okay. Uh, so I just want to ask you some questions. You testified to a lot of things. I missed some things, but just want to kind of clarify some of the things you've talked about, okay? Of course. And so my understanding is, and we're going to go back to your original involvement in this case. I, I believe you had stated um, you were, or still am employed at BCI. That's correct. And during your occupation or your employment with BCI, you were... Uh, invited to come listen to, I, I guess, uh, questions or, or things that were being said about this particular case. Is that right? That's correct. And the, and the reason for that was because um, you are um, a forensic accountant, right? Correct. And there may be things that are being discussed that a forensic accountant could discover or would know that the other folks in the group wouldn't, right? That's correct. Okay. And so... During this discussion, you were told of certain things that would be of importance to, to know if they had been purchased, right? Yes. And I think you've said many times, you know, you're not an expert in these particular areas, but uh, you knew enough to pay attention and to look for purchases of certain items, right? I'm, I'm an expert in certain areas, but I'm not an expert in things like construction of silencers or firearms, that sort of thing. Right. And so... If you flag some type of purchase uh, that may be related, um, you're not saying that's actual evidence in this case. That's just something you were told that could be important here, right? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the question. Yeah, so when you, well, let me go back. Um, when you want to look at expenses or things that people yes. have bought, let's go through this process. Would you uh, perhaps subpoena their bank records? Yes. And with those bank records, you would get the, like a monthly statement, right? Yeah, monthly statements and deposit detail, checks, basically all that sort of, all the data I could get. Yes. And uh, we'll get to it soon, but you'll also get uh, whatever paperwork is generated when somebody opens an account, right? Sometimes. And when they open that account, that would be the owner of the account, right? That's correct. Or the signer, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so when you do that, and you, uh, I should say, when you request those banking records, your job is to go through and to look at the purchases that have been made through that account, right? Yes. And so going back to when you're listening to these discussions about what's going on and you're told about certain things that could be important, that's actually what you're looking for on that transaction register, right? That's correct. And so back to my question where I lost you was, just because you found something uh, that seemed important to you, you're not saying that's actual evidence in this case, right? It's, it's evidence in the case, okay. but, it may, but it may or may not be relevant. Right. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. So I think, I think we're in agreement on this. Yes. All right. I just, I'll take a few moments in between my questions. I just had some questions, and as sure. I go through them, I'm going to check them out. So just bear with me. All right. So... 
I'm going to refer to some of the documents that are there in front of you. Okay. As you were reviewing accounts, and there were several accounts that you reviewed for purchases, I want to draw your attention to an account on, or it's a credit card at Bass Pro Shops through Bank of America. And I believe the last four digits would be 4298. That's correct. And if you don't have that in front of you, let me know, and I'll look on this table to see if I can find the documentation you need. Do you mean the, the detail? Yes. Uh, I do not have that in front of me. Okay. I do have the um, summary of what I pointed as the relevant transactions. Okay, yeah. So that... that yep. And you'll but, see there's a red sticker up there. Does that say CC2 or CCC2? That's correct. Okay. And so you went through a lot, and I just kind of want to sum this up to make sure I understand correctly. But as you were going through those purchases, and you were looking, and you keep, you know, you were keeping in mind what it is you're looking for, these relevant purchases, um, starting at the top of the list, you found, or you flagged a relevant purchase occurring on March the 7th, 2015, and the item is a 1911 45 ACP mil spec muzzle brake, right? Do you see that there? Yes. Okay. Now, have I said something that flagged, that would have flagged your attention as being relevant or being pertinent to this investigation with that particular item? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, if you look there at the item, yes. 1911 45 ACP mil spec muzzle brake. Did I read that correctly as the item? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so now my question was, as you were reviewing these items, what was it about that one that caught your interest that may be pertinent to this case? It did, did fit in the category of firearms, firearms, accessories, uh, that sort of thing. That That's... That's all. So would it be fair to say that you're aware that a 1911 45 ACP is a firearm? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and that's what flagged your attention? Yes. Right? And in fact, that's one of those purchases that's made with that card of the last four digits ending in 3984, is that right? Uh, that was 4298. 4298, you're right. right. And 4298, again, is the last four digits of the card that bought the 1911 45 ACP mil spec. And who is the owner of that card? That's Jake Wagner. Okay. All right. So the reason I'm asking you this is because there were, it seemed like there were a lot of accounts that had two names on those, but that's just Jake Wagner, right? Yes. Okay. And while we're talking about that 4298 card, which is the Bass Pro Shops, if you'll look down that page you're looking at, there was a purchase on March the 27th, 2016, and that was at Bass Pro Shops. And what was it about that purchase that caught your attention as being pertinent here? This was the purchase at Bass Pro Shops we're talking about, right? Yes, on yes. March the 27th, 16 at Bass Pro. Yes, so um, there were a few items that were, uh, there's ammunition that was purchased and a magazine for a weapon that was purchased. Okay, let me first ask you about the ammunition. Sure. Uh, the make or the manufacturer of that would be Tulamo, is that right? Yes. And do you see 7.62 by 39? That's correct. Okay. And again, that is on that card ending in 4298, which is owned by who? That's uh, Jake Wagner. And he's the sole owner of that card, right? That's correct. And so what that means is when those statements come in the mail, they're going to come in addressed to him, right? That's correct. Okay. And then perhaps uh, it's on the same day, there's an SKS magazine, 30 rounds. Do you see that purchase? Yes. And does that also say 7.62 by 39? Yes. And we saw those same numbers on the Tulamo purchase, right? That's correct. 
And that also was purchased with the Bass Pro card belonging to Jake Wagner, Wagner right? Yes. Okay. And speaking of Bass Pro Shops, right below that, on April the 3rd of 2016, do you see a live well bait net purchase? Yes. And what flagged your attention as being relevant about that? <laughs> um, just in speaking with special agents, I understood that bait nets could be used to create, uh, to craft uh, brass catchers. Uh, okay. And that was a cash purchase, right? That's correct. Made by Edward Jake Wagner. That's correct. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the top of the list. I think we've exhausted purchases just on the Bass Pro card. Now I'm going to direct your attention to purchases made uh, through a checking account ending in 3376 from First State Bank. Okay. Um, and so I don't know if you've got a form there that might say CCC1. I do. That has accounts. I do. And if you look for First State Bank with an account ending in 3376, who's the signer or the owner of that account? That's Jake Wagner. Okay, so I'm going to focus on those purchases made on that account. Mm -hmm. Remember we talked earlier about a 1911? Yes. Do you remember? And, and we agreed that's a gun, right? Do you mean the muzzle brake? Uh, or just the 1911? Does that signify a gun to you? A 1911 is, is a model or style of gun, yes. Okay, and so I'd like to direct your attention down to a purchase that occurred on February the 26th of 16. And the retailer's Tactical Innovations, do you see that? Yes. And what is that item there that was purchased? This is a thread adapter with thread protector for a Colt uh, or Umarex, I'm probably saying that wrong, okay. 1911. Um, 22 caliber uh, long range. Okay, and so we see thread adapt adapter. Um, is there something about that that signified your interest that that could be important here? Could that be something that threads into the end of a barrel? Yes. Okay, and that that purchase was actually made on that card of 3376 or on that account, right? That's correct. Which we earlier said belongs to who? That'd be Jake Wagner. And is he the only owner of that account? Uh, I'm sorry. Is he the only owner of that account? Yes, he is. Okay. And I think another thing that you had mentioned, well, let me see if I got this correct. I'm going to ask you to look down at a purchase occurring on February the 29th of 16 in the retail of Amazon. And it's also a purchase using those four last digits of 3376. Do you see a purchase on that day, February the 29th of 16 from Amazon? I do. And what is that for? Uh, there were multiple items. Is that, do you mean one specific item or just? Yeah, how about Drill America, DWDDL? Yes. yes. Okay, was there something about that that interested you that may be relevant? Um, I was told to keep an eye out for any uh, tools and equipment that basically would could be used for uh, metal smithing, for, for precision um, drilling, uh, you know, adapters, that sort of thing. Okay, maybe making a silencer or a suppressor? That's correct. Okay, and that was purchased on that account ending in 3376, which again belongs to who? Jake Wagner. And he's the only owner of that account, right? That's correct. Okay. And then I, it looks like there was another purchase on the same day for the same item. So there were two of those drill bits bought, right? Yes, that's right. Both, both, both by Jake Wagner on, on an account that he's the sole owner of. That's correct. Okay. 
Now, you were also told that flashlights would be an item of interest because they could be fashioned as a suppressor or silencer. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Which I'm assuming that's why you then flagged a, a, a purchase on the same day as those drill bits through Amazon was the great light, high-intensity aluminum flashlight. Do you see that? Yes. And was that also purchased on Jake Edward Wagner's account ending in 3376? It was. In which he's the sole owner of that account, right? Yeah, just Jake. Okay. And on March the 1st, through the NTC Trading Company, and before I go further, NTC Trading Company, do you know the origin of that company? Where are they out of? Um... I, I don't remember offhand. I believe it's on the detailed schedule that I prepared. Okay. Uh, so if it's important, I think we could... The item from that company, though, is what? It is a uh, high-quality plug and tap. Okay. And, is, and did that catch your attention because that would be something used to make a suppressor or a silencer? That's correct. And that was, the payment went through PayPal, but the funds came from the account ending in 3376. Is that right? That's, that's right. And again, that is that account that's solely owned by Jake Wagner. That's correct. Okay. And while you were looking for, or the plug tap had caught your attention, there was a purchase also on the same day of March 1st, a hex die. Do you see that item? I do. And did that catch your attention because that's also something used for a suppressor? Yes. And that was also purchased on the account ending in 3376 in which Jake Wagner is the sole owner. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. On the following day, there's a purchase of a long drill bit straight shank, right? Do you see that? Yes, I do. And we talked about those drill bits because that would be something that you would use to, to fabricate or make a suppressor with, right? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. And that was also purchased on the account ending in 3376 in which Jake Wagner's the sole owner. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. And you've already told us that flashlights were important, and I think you saw another flashlight purchase on March the 2nd through Amazon. Is that right? Um, there was a purchase on uh, March the 2nd with Amazon. It wasn't, was not for a flashlight. Okay. And that's important. Tell me, what do you see there as the item? Do you see that Maglite D cell? Yes. Okay. And could you read the rest? Yeah, of course. So it's a Maglite D-cell solvent trap combo. Okay, did you say solvent or solvent? Solvent. Oh, okay, all right. I may be saying it incorrectly. No, I think you said that right. Uh, that's a thread adapter, is that right? A thread adapter and light bulb end cap. And it looks like that was of importance because that's also something that you would use to make a suppressor. That's my understanding, and yes. And was purchased on the account ending in 3376 in which Jake Wagner is the sole owner of that account. That's correct. Okay. And again, on March the 17th of 2016 through Amazon, uh, there, you, it looks like you had discovered a Qualtech high-speed steel right-hand threading tap. Yes. And that also was purchased on the account ending in 3376 in which Jake Wagner is the sole owner, right? That's correct. Okay. On March the 17th through Amazon is a 9 16th inch 24 right hand thread die. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And that was also purchased on that account belonging to Jake Wagner. Yes, that's correct. And it's that account in which he is the sole owner of that account, right? Yes. Okay. Speaking of these items purchased by Jake Wagner on April the 3rd of 2016, do you also see a brass catcher that was purchased at Bass Pro Shops? 
Yes, that's that, correct. That was a cash purchase by Jake Wagner, is that right? Yes. And so we had talked about all the accounts, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I did not see any account in which the owner or signer or co-signers involved George Wagner, Billy Wagner, Angela Wagner, and Jake Wagner. Am I correct? There were no accounts with all four of them on? Yes. That's correct. There were. I did not see any accounts with all four, all four family members. Okay, and so there was some question. Uh, there was some discussion uh, in, during your direct examination about transferring money. Um, yes. And one could assume the reason why money had to be transferred is because everybody was not on one account, right? Yes. Okay, and so you were asked questions about um, things operating as a unit. Wouldn't, if we were looking for somebody operating as a unit, wouldn't we expect to see an account with everybody's name on it? Uh, it could be, yeah. Okay. So if there was an account with everybody's name on it, that would be evidence of operating as a unit, right? That would be, yes. Yes. And if, if we have a living arrangement where perhaps somebody pays a utility bill, and I think you testified that some utility bills or almost all utility bills were paid by one or two particular people in this, uh, of the Wagner family, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. And so in a situation like that, we talked about sharing expenses. Uh, didn't you see sharing of expenses or transferring of money from some family members to others? Yes. Okay, and so when you pay a utility bill, you pay through one account, not multiple, right? Generally, yes. So, for example, if you and I live together and I'm paying the electric bill, it, I would pay it from my account, and you would just give me the money to pay your half, right? Yeah, that could be. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you about another purchase, but before I get there, do you have the document in front of you that has been previously marked as uh, State's Exhibit CCC17? If you don't have it, I'll come and look on that table and see if I, I can find don't, it. I don't have it in front of me. Okay. No. Um, do you have that? I'm going to hand you a document that's previously been marked State's Exhibit CCC 17. Yes, sir. Do you recognize that document? I do. And what is that? This is uh, the detail on a auto loan uh, from First State Bank. Okay. And what kind of auto is that? What, what sort of? I'm sorry, I did. There is an auto that's mentioned or description of the vehicle? Yes, that's correct. And, and what is that vehicle? So there, there were two vehicles that were purchased with this loan. All right. A uh, 2007 Chevy uh, 2500 and a 2007 Dodge S35. Okay. Did I hear that correctly? A 2007 Chevrolet Silverado 2500 or maybe you just said 2500? I just said 2500. I, okay. Yeah. All right. So I now I'm going to shift gears with you. If you could grab that document, it may at the top say Schedule C, but I believe it's been previously marked as CCC2. Yes. Let me know when you have that. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to direct your attention down to a purchase that the prosecution asked you about that occurring on April the 18th, 2016 from OK Auto Parts. Do you see that transaction? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. 
And do you see over just to the right, it says receipt number, and then you go down, and then there's a number there that appears that falls under receipt number. What is that? The number of the receipt? Okay, so that's a number that we would actually see on the receipt, right? It, yes. And what is that number? It is 001 01-018395. Okay. Now, and th this purchase was for what? What is the item? The item that was highlight that I highlighted was uh, Wix filter, uh, 33960 heavy duty spin on fuel water separator. And that caught your attention as something that may be relevant in this case. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And so we talked about how you're going to get information about purchases, and, and one of the ways that you'll get that is through actual receipts from the retailer. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to now show you what has been previously marked as Wagner Exhibit 32. Could you look at that and just look over for a moment? I'll ask you some questions. does that document appear to be? A um, receipt from uh, OK Auto Parts. OK Auto Parts. And the purchase date or the, re the date on that receipt would be? This would be April 18th, 2016. OK. And remember when we just talked about the financing for the vehicle and I asked you if it was a Chevrolet or you told me it was? Yes. Do you actually see that at the top of that receipt there, that, that vehicle? Yes. What does it say? So there's, it's a 2007 Chevrolet truck Silverado 2500. Okay. And OK, and I believe that that receipt is from OK Auto Parts, right? Yes, that's correct. And so underneath that vehicle, there are three different items. Is that right? Three items. Yes, that's correct. And what are those items? Um, it looks like an air filter, uh, the fuel filter. And um, what I believe are light bulbs, but I'm not sure what the third item is. Okay. And all three of those vehicle items fall under that listing of a 2007 Chevrolet, right? Yes. Which we already know through the other exhibit that was being financed by George Wagner, right? That's correct. And in fact, you've got that per listed on your list of relevant purchases made by George Wagner. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. But you didn't list those other items as items of interest, such as the air filter, though, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, through your review of the records, you're not telling us that you have all of the financial records of George Wagner, are you? No. Okay. In fact, there could be some records out there, perhaps, uh, by Glockner Credit Union that you just weren't aware of to even request. Yes, that's definitely a possibility. In which he could be the sole owner of that uh, account, right? Yes. Okay. And similarly, such as Snap-on, did you check with them to see if Mr. Wagner had an account with them? No. Okay. All right. Uh, you were asked yesterday I'm going to go off your memory. If you don't recall, I'll try and find the exhibit. But yesterday, the prosecution asked you about a insurance check that had been, been deposited into an account in the amount of $40,000. Yes, I remember that. that. Yes. And I believe your testimony was that that was George Wagner's account. Is that right? Um, I, I don't remember. I'm sorry. Okay.
Let me see if I can find that up here. In addition to that $40,000 check from an insurance company, I believe you testified to maybe two other deposits uh, from an insurance company. Is that right? Yeah, there, there were multiple deposits uh, from, I believe it was great, great um, casualty, something like that. Uh, let me see if I can find, I'm looking for CCC6. All right, I'm going to hand you what has been previously marked as State's Exhibit CCC6. Yes, sir. Go ahead and take your time. Take a look at that. I'm going to recognize that. Yes, sir. I do. All right, and so I'm going to ask you about that, that deposit of $40,000 into that account. Tell me when you see that. May see it around February of 2016. Okay, thank you. There's a lot of transactions on yes. this account. Okay, yes, I see that transaction. Okay, all right. Now, I believe, it, yeah, if you could just hold your finger there, but I believe on the front page you have an account number in which this check was deposited into. Tell me what that account number is. Yes, so it's a First State Bank account, 713-848. Okay, 713-848. Now, I believe you had said, as a forensic accountant, in doing these investigative duties, you will issue, or someone on your behalf will issue subpoenas to banks to get the, uh, the account holder, for example. Yes. And the statements, right? That's correct. And so I'm going to show you what has been previously marked as... Wagner Exhibit 30. You go ahead and take your time. Take a look at that. Yes, sir. Tell me if you recognize what type of document that is. Yes, so this is the signature sheet. Okay. The signature sheet to what? For account 713-848. Yeah, and that's the account in which the $40,000 check was deposited into, right? Yes, that's correct. And Feel free to thumb through those pages and tell me who the owner of that account is. I believe you'll find there's two co-signers. Yes, signers. that's correct. So there, there are two signers on the account. Okay. Um, that will be... Uh, George Wagner and Angela Wagner. Yes, and is there a date of birth for George? Mm -hmm. uh, June 4th, 1971. June 4th of 1971, that would put that individual at about 50 some years old? Correct. All right. Now, I believe you previously or testified that that account belonged to George Wagner. Correct. And I so did. you were mistaken, is that right? Let me ask you another question. I believe we agreed, or I believe you had stated on your direct examination that we would differentiate the defendant, the accused's father is Billy and him is George. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so your testimony yesterday was that that account belonged to the accused, George Wagner. 
Yes, that's right. And so that forty thousand dollar check that was that was deposited into the account was actually deposited into his father's account. Yes, that's 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 what it appears. In which he's a co-owner with Angela Wagner. Yes. Okay. I'm now going to show you what has been previously marked as Wagner Exhibit 31. Okay. Do you know if you recognize what that document is? Yes, that is a statement uh, for account 713848. And is that the same account that Billy Wagner and Angela Wagner are the owners of? Yes. And if you could, could you go to the very last page and tell me if you see a deposit slip? Uh, yes. And do you see a deposit in the amount of $40,000? I do. And whose name is on that as the, as the person making the deposit? Uh, George Wagner the III. The III, yep. which is not the accused, right? That's correct. Okay. While we've got that account in mind that ends in, if you could tell me one more time. That account ends in 3848, is that right? 3848, that's correct. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears with you and ask you to look at what the state's exhibit CCC2. Tell me when you've got that in front of you. Yes. All right, now I'm going to draw your attention to a purchase which occurred on February the 17th of 2016. Let me know when you found that. Uh, yes, I found it. And the retailer is O'Reilly's Auto Parts, is that right? That's correct. Okay, now the item is a Wix oil filter, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And if oil filter was one of those items that was flagged for your attention and that it could be fashioned to a, a suppressor or silencer, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and if you look, You've got the purchaser as George Wagner, is that right? That's correct. All right, and that account ends in 3848 from First State Bank, is that right? Yes. Now, referring back to that account where the $40,000 check was deposited into, that ends in 3848. That's correct. And it is First State Bank. Yes. And that is an account that's owned, in fact, by Billy Wagner and Angela Wagner. Yes. So this pertinent account and who purchased that item is wrong, is that right? I would have to see the receipt. But, okay. Um, well, I'm going to ask you to look on, at the document you generated, CCC2. Yes. You have the purchaser of that item as George Wagner. Is that That's right? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So just give me one moment, sir. Finances and who was paying what particular bills. But, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in the course of your investigation, you had also retrieved taxation records. Is that right? I did. And do you have any reportable income from Angela Wagner? Yes. Okay. And how much? And who? When? What years is that? Um, I, I don't recall offhand. Okay. All right. Uh, and so you couldn't tell me if I asked you if that's minimal, if any. I can tell you it was it was not a large amount. Um, okay. I believe I have uh, two to three years of tax returns, and yeah, Angela Wagner's income was was minimal. Okay, all right. And uh, I believe that you had said that um, her sons. I believe that your testimony was through paying uh, utilities. Uh, I don't think she paid any, or, or her sons had paid those utilities. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And. You talked about 
a uh, home equity loan that had been taken out on the home. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. And uh, I mean, a home equity loan is simply borrowing against your property, right? That's correct. And uh, typically, if you were to, say, pay off credit cards, you would have a lower interest rate on that home equity than you would that line of credit on the credit card. Is that right? Yeah, that's often the case. Okay. And so, through being a forensic accountant, uh, I mean, is there anything criminal that jumps out at you that a, a, a son would pay for his, you know, mother's expenses? No, that's not criminal. Okay. Yes. And while someone's account may have been used, you're not testifying that that particular owner of the account made the purchase, though, right? That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. We've been at it for about an hour and 45 minutes. Does the uh, state wish to redirect? I am going to ask questions when we take a break. All right. So we'll take a 15 minute. Uh, morning break, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. While we are on break, uh, you're not to discuss this case among yourselves uh, or with anyone else. You're not to permit anyone to discuss this case with you or in your presence. You're not to form or to express an opinion concerning this case. You are to do no research concerning this case, either as to the facts or as to the law from any source at all. You're not to view, read, or listen to any reports or any accounts of this case from any source at all. You're to have no contact with any of the participants in the trial, including parties, counsel, and witnesses. Um, at 11 o'clock, you're to assemble at the jury room. You'll be brought up uh, from there by court personnel, as you're aware. Does counsel for either side have anything you wish to say on the record before we recess our 15-minute morning recess? Then we are in recess until 11 o'clock.
may be seated. The state may conduct a direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Welcome. Mr. Kazar, you were asked on direct examination about state's exhibit triple C6, is that correct? That's correct. And again, can you tell us what state's exhibit triple C6 is? This is the detail for First State Bank account 713848. And again, Mr. Nash asked you some questions about an insurance payment into that account, is that correct? That's correct. I want you to go with me through some of that account, if you would. And I want to direct your attention to May of 2015. May of 2015? Yes, correct. Specifically, May 25th of 2015. On May 25th of 2015, is there a transfer out of that account into a different account? Actually, you know what? Let me give you what's been marked state's exhibit triple C13. Okay, let's try that one. Thank you. State's exhibit triple C13. Can you tell us what that is? Yes. Okay, what is that? This is Capital One credit card ending in 4543. Okay, and who does that credit card belong to? George Wagner. Okay, the defendant, George Wagner. Correct. Okay, with respect to triple C6, triple C6, what's the account number associated with triple C6? 3848. If you would, direct your attention to George Wagner's Cabela credit card account information. Let's go to May 25th of 2015 in that record, triple C6. Yes. Okay. With respect to May 25th of 2015, is there a transfer into George Wagner's Cabela account on that day? Yes, there is. Okay, and what account is that transfer coming from? That's coming from the First State Bank 3848. I'll direct your attention to July 4th of 2015. Again, on July 4th of 2015, with respect to George Wagner's credit card, is there a transfer into that credit card account on July 4th, 2015? There is. And where is that transfer coming from? From that account, 3848. February 10th, 2016, again, is there a transfer into George Wagner's Cabela's credit card on that day? There is. And what account is that from? From account 3848. March 14th, 2016, is there a transfer into George Wagner's Cabela's credit card on that day? There is. And how much is that for? $4,840.55. And what account is that from? From 3848. July 9th, 2016, on George Wagner's credit card records, is there a transfer into that account? There is. And what account is that from? That's from 3848. November 3rd, 2016, with respect to George Wagner's credit card, is there a transfer into that account on November 3rd, 2016? There is. And what account is that from? From 3848. January 3rd, 2017, is there a transfer into George Wagner's credit card from that account? There is. And what account is that from? 3848. January 26th, 2017, is there a transfer into George Wagner's Cabela's credit card? There is. What account is that from? 3848. February 24th, 2017, is there a transfer into George Wagner's Cabela's credit card? There is. And what account is that from? 3848. With respect to State Exhibit CCC, 
Yes. Which is the account that Mr. Nash asked you about. As you review uh, that document or those records, again, are there transfers out of that account into both Jake and George's uh, accounts? Yes, many. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit Triple C 8. State's Exhibit Triple C 8, can you tell us what that is? Yes, that is uh, Ohio Valley Bank account 672-1508. And, again, who does that account belong to? It's a George Wagner and Angela Wagner. And are there payments into that account uh, from Frederica Wagner? Uh, transfers, yes. Transfers. Okay. Can you tell us what that is? There's a transfer on uh, January 21st, 2014 uh, for $33,000. It's a check that was deposited, um, payable to George Wagner the fourth. And that check, when you when you identify that check as payable to George Wagner the fourth, that's something that you've actually looked at and confirmed that that's George <coughs> Wagner the fourth, correct? That's correct. All right. And following that transfer, is there a transfer of uh, a large amount of money out of that account? Yes, there is. Okay. Before we go to that transfer, in addition to uh, that transfer out with respect to triple C eight. Um, are there various legal expenses that have been paid out of that account? Uh, actually, let me go to CC. No. Okay. Let's go to triple C nine. Okay. So you got triple C eight in your hand there. Yes, sir. We're talking about a transfer of money out of that account. Yep. Um, what account did the money go into? Um, so this, this was 10 days after the deposit of the check from Frederica Wagner. On uh, January 31st, 2014, there was a, trans a bank transfer uh, from this account. It's $25,880, and it went to account uh, 6205 which is an Ohio Valley Bank account in the name of George and Jake. Okay. And again, is that George, the defendant, and his brother Jake? Correct. Okay. In addition to that transfer into that account, in State's Exhibit Triple C 9, uh, are there legal expenses that are annotated in that account? Yes. Okay, and whose legal expenses are those? Who's it paid to, I guess? Well, so, actually, I think it probably would be, it's, it's from uh, Young and Caldwell, which is a law firm. It's actually a check from that law firm. Okay. And so it's not an expense, it's a check that was written, payable to Edward and George Wagner. Okay. And... In addition to that check, are there deposits from Ohio Casualty Insurance? Ohio Casualty, yes. And who are those made up to? Edward, uh, Jake, and George. Okay. Yeah, with respect to those insurance payments, can you give us the amounts of those payments? Sure. So, um, February 19th, 2014, there's a check that's deposited for $8,690.45. Um, there's one before that actually that's January 14th, 2014 uh, from Ohio Casualty payable for $9,916.70. There's one on April 9th, 2014 from Ohio Casualty for $15,461.53. There's one on August 18th, 2014 from Ohio Casualty for $18,706.57. And 
And there's one on October 7th, 2014 from Ohio Casualty for $13,000. $861.20. And with respect to all of those insurance payouts, who were they made out to? Uh, George and Jake. Okay. When you were doing your work in this case, you testified both on direct and cross that the investigative team told you what to look out for. Is that correct? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? The investigative team kind of gave you some items to look out for. Is that That's correct? correct, yes. And uh, again, you testified, I think, to Mr. Nash's question that um, you considered it all to be evidence, but whether or not it was relevant was another decision, right? That's correct. Okay. When you first were given that list, again, was it a, a wide list of just general stuff that could be evidence in this case to look for? I wouldn't consider it that wide. It was it was fairly specific, actually. Okay. So what kind of stuff were you looking for? So things that could be used to fashion silencers, okay. which include things like flashlights, uh, oil filters, um, uh, anything that looks like it's a, it's a specialty tool to craft a silencer. So special drill bits, um, adapters, and anything that had to do with firearms. So both firearms themselves, firearms accessories, any tactical equipment, anything like that, you know, for so, yeah, so anything like that. Okay. And again, uh, was fuel filters or component parts like filters something else that you were asked to look for? Yes. Anything related or annotated to a firearm, were you asked to note that as well? That's correct. Okay. So Mr. Nash asked you about uh, March 7th, 2015, uh, purchase related to a 1911 45. ACP, and I think you testified that it was a muzzle break for a, a 45 1911, right? That's correct. Again, when you're annotating that, do you have any idea whether or not that is actually involved in this case or just something that you've been told to look out for, the type of thing you've been It just for? fits into the criteria, the category that I'm looking for. And later on, uh, you annotated, and again, Mr. Nash asked you about a purchase from February 26, 2016, which is, which was that? Tactical Innovation 1911 Unirex like thread adapter or something like that. Do you remember that? I think it was like a solvent trap or something. Okay. Maybe, solvent that, was, trap maybe or something. that was a different item, but yes, I, I, I recall what you're talking about. Okay. And again, with respect to the 1911-22, is that something that you were just told to look out for, the kind of stuff that you were told to look out for? Yes. Mr. Nash asked you multiple times about Jake Wagner's Bass Pro Shops account. Yes. Remember that? Yes. And uh, he asked you multiple times, Jake was the only one on this account. Is that right? That's correct. And after every purchase, he would ask you, this account belongs solely to Jake Wagner, correct? That's correct. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. It's State Exhibit Triple C 13. Tell the jury what that is. So this is the detail uh, for Capital One um, credit card account. It's Cabela's card uh, ending in 4543. March 18th, 2016. Is there a purchase on that card for Brickhouse Electronics that you later identified as a bug detector? That's correct. Same question. Again, the time that the purchase was made, that Cabela's account, only George Wagner's on that account, correct? That's correct. And then March 21st, 2016, a uh, purchase from a Chinese company in the amount of $630.59. Do you see that on there as well? I do. And again, at the time of that purchase, George Wagner, the only one who's listed on that account, correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, he also asked you, uh, when you're the only person listed on the account, the, the, the bills for the account come to the person listed on the account, correct? Yes, that's correct. Would that be the same with fraud detection? If, if uh, something trips off a fraud detection uh, alert, does the credit card company notify the owner of the account? 
Yes. Okay. And who was the owner of, of this account? George. With respect to uh, other purchases on that credit card, uh, flashlights, and then uh, the purchase of Waverly Rural King, again, only listed owner of that credit card at that time is this defendant, George Wagner, correct? Correct. Mr. Nash asked you about one joint account, whether or not a, a joint account existed with all four people on it. Is that correct? Yes. And you testified that there wasn't a joint account. Is that correct? With, with all with, four? With all four people, no. There were no accounts like that. Okay. And you also testified, I believe, that if there was a joint account, again, that could be evidence of people working together or, or sharing finances, that kind of stuff. Sure, true? it could be. In the absence of a joint account, do you look for transfers among existing accounts to show that connectivity? Yes. And did you see that in this case? Yes. And as part of your time at, at BCI, have you been involved in investigations involving the, the, the crime of engaging in a pattern of corrupt activity? I have. And is one of the things that you look for in those types of investigation that type of enterprise or that type of connectivity with respect to joint finances? Yes. Okay. And that, that's the key thing I look for. Did you see those same types of patterns with respect to these four defendants? Yes. Yes. With respect to the existence of other accounts that this defendant may or may not, not have had. Did you look for and review every account that you knew that he had or that you knew existed involving not only this defendant but all four of the defendants? Yes, within within the date range that we that I felt was relevant for this investigation in consultation with the team. Um, yes. These are, these are all of the accounts that I am aware of that could be relevant to the investigation. <laughs> and not only the, the, the defendants individually, but also any corporate entities that they may be involved with. Correct. I have nothing further. Any further calls? Yes, thank you, Judge. Sir, I just have a couple questions for you about your investigation into these accounts and financial matters. Yes, sir. Uh, could you tell me if your investigation uh, revealed that Edward J. Wagner requested $20,000 for the care of his daughter because her mother was murdered? A GoFundMe? Are you aware of that? Or no. Income of that sort? No. Okay. Uh, so let me ask you, are you aware of of him even creating the account asking for money to help because of her mother passing or being uh, a, a GoFundMe? Yes. Uh, no. Okay, so that didn't nope. didn't even reach your investigation. Okay. For me personally, no. So I just have a couple basic questions for you about accounts. Uh, if I have a bank account, that gives me exclusive right to that account, right? That's correct. Assuming there's no other co-signers on that account. That's correct. And so one of the things you look for uh, as a forensic accountant, um, if, say, me and three other people were uh, in some organization, it would certainly raise a red flag if we were all on one account, right? If me and three other people were in an organization and you suspected criminal activity, it would raise a red flag if we were all in the same account, right? Uh, that alone wouldn't raise a red flag, but it would be certainly an account that I would want to see. Okay. I, to, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm threading it too fine, but... Yeah, yeah. And so, from what I understand, so if we're all four on one account, that could be a sign that we're operating together, right? Correct. And if we have separate accounts, but we transfer money, then that's also another sign that we could be operating together. Is that Correct. right? Correct, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so how do we differentiate between legitimate money owed to somebody and making those transfers? 
versus there actually being some corrupt organization? Uh, I don't think that distinction was important in this case. Okay, all right. Not, it was something that you didn't feel was important to, to know why money was being transferred, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, we talked about expenses and when they were made, um, and we understand that certain expenses were made out of certain accounts, but you're not aware of George's work record or when he was working, are you? I have some awareness of that. Okay. And so, for example, uh, when particular purchases were made, do you know whether he was on the road, truck driving, or at home? Was that part of your investigation? Um, no. Okay. And we talked about items of interest to you or items that, you know, that came into your knowledge that would be of interest to this investigation. One of those was flashlights. When you would see a particular item that was purchased, would you go out to actually look at that item? Like, you mean physically? Yes. To determine whether or not it could really be used for whatever you think. Oh, no. Oh. I, I, I'm not an expert in that area. Okay. And you would agree with me, we talked about the purchase of, by George Wagner of a, um, of a fuel filter. You would agree with me that that purchase is less significant when it's for a vehicle that he actually owns, right? Yeah. I'm asking if he agrees. It's up to the jury how much weight they well, have. Well, I'll agree with the question, but I'm not sure. But I'm not sure. You would agree with me that purchase of a fuel filter is less significant to your investigation if it's for a vehicle that he actually owns? Yes. Okay. It's also less significant if he's buying other items that also go to that vehicle at the same time, right? Yes. Okay. Any further direct? Yeah. Sorry. We could have one. Yes. Um, I did look at that, but I don't remember offhand. Okay. And as far as any payments, I asked you about income, as far as any payments uh, transferred to Angela Wagner, are you aware of her providing child care for George? Um, I did see payments to Angela from both George and Jake. Uh, checks that were written that I believe had a, a notation in the memo line that said something like child care or, or something on, on that order. So, yes. Okay. And that would, that would apply to some of those transfers that the prosecution just asked you about. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can we talk about transfers? Some of those transfers were large transfers. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, $8,500, for example. Correct? Yes. That's not child care, is it? Objection. I'm sorry? Objection. Well, I'll let him answer it if he knows. Did you, did you see any transfers for large sums of money, such as $8,500, that were related to child care? Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't know what the transfer was for. Obviously, he asked you about fuel filters and if, if a, a vehicle, uh, if they had a vehicle, you know, would that be less significant? Mm -hmm. He asked you that question. If electronics purchased on this defendant's credit card were linked to the homicide or used the homicide, would that be significant? Yes, it would be. No. Any further? <coughs> 
Sir, in regards to your investigation, are you aware that Angela Wagner said she bought the bug detector? Your Honor, I'll sustain the objection. It's an objection. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. No further questions. You may step down. You may you may step down. Thank you. The state may call its next witness. Um, thank you, Your Honor. The state is going to recall Special Agent Schneider. Your right hand, you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer unto God. I do. You may be seated. The state may examine. Could you please state your name again for the record? Ryan Scheider. Okay. And Agent Scheider, I'm going to talk to you about several. Um, topics today. Um, first of all, just regarding the searches of Peterson Road, we've already heard discussions, some of which you provided and some of which other witnesses provided, regarding a search of Peterson Road uh, on May 10th of 2017, of May 12th of 2017, and then again, I believe June 15th and 16th of 2017, correct? I believe it's 14th through 15th, but yes. Okay, thank you, sorry. And did you um, participate in some capacity or were present for each of those searches? Yes, I was. Okay. And for the record, again, I, I know there's been testimony about this, but just for clarification purposes, uh, each of those searches I've just mentioned, the two in May and the two in June, which were very close in proximity to each other, obviously, um, all of that was before anybody knew that a Walther Colt 1911-22 uh, long rifle was used in this crime, correct? Correct. Okay. That information did not come until July of 17, correct? Co correct. Okay. Um, also, just again, to kind of orient the jury, um, we heard testimony from Ms. Eveslage discussing going through the contents of the laptop that was recovered um, at the Montana border in the vehicle that the Wagners arrived at the border in, correct? Yes. Okay. And specifically going through thousands of screenshots and images and uh, iPhone backups and all the other stuff that was contained on that laptop, correct? Yes. Okay. And was that something that you also participated in? Yes, I did. Okay. And can you give us the time that that occurred? The review of the data that was extracted would have been through the winter of 2017 into 2018 uh, into the beginning of the spring of 2018. It took several months to go through all that data. Okay very extensive amount of information yes it was a large amount of information on that device okay and just you know we've heard um testimony previously i believe for example the um phone that you got a search warrant for to um, from jake wagner um where there was this immediate extraction performed correct yes okay and did that occur um, in regards to this laptop that was recovered at the Montana border? No, it did not. Okay. And can you tell us the process? Um, first of all, did BCI even return with that laptop in your possession? No, we did not. Okay. Where did that uh, laptop, where was that laptop? It was seized in Montana, so it remained locked up in Montana in their, uh, in their control. So we did not have immediate access to it because they seized it. Okay. And then did you later get a search warrant to have that um, device transferred to your possession? Yes, there was a court order moving it to Ohio, and then we had to get a court order or a search warrant to access it. Okay. And you're aware that one of the images that was recovered from that laptop, um, specifically in the iPhone backup, um, from Jake's iPhone to that laptop was the two different images of that of a Colt 1911-22. The, the Walther Colt 1911, yes. Okay. And again, 
that would have been after Matt White had concluded that it was likely that a Walther 1911-22 was used in this offense. Correct. Okay. Okay, I'm going to refer you back to 260 Peterson Road again. Um, over the last few days, and I won't remember exactly which day it was, um, we were listening to conversations that were captured during the 2017 interception warrant, correct? Yes. And um, those interception warrants were to a vehicle for a short time and then a phone devices for all four uh, Wagners, correct? Yes. Were you a participant in either a participant in either the monitoring or the daily briefing briefings that occurred pursuant to uh, those monitored conversations? Yes, being the case agent, I was provided with updates daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes as things happened with the activities that was being monitored in the wire room. Uh, that's one of the requirements uh, that the case agent or lead investigator, as well as the affiant and the supervising attorney, which is a prosecutor, are. Well, uh, so so yes, I guess is, was the answer to the question. And the rest of it goes beyond that. So well, I right. sustain the objection to all portions of the response after the word yes. Okay, and what was your participation? Uh, I was the lead agent. I was the um, investigating the head investigator of the case, and so I was provided with updates of what was being monitored, whether it was through the vehicle intercept or the telephone intercepts. Okay. And were you also um, conducting some investigative activities during that time that would often provoke conversations on those um, devices? That was my primary duty, yes. Okay. And also as an aside, again, just um, to clear up some details, there was a, there was a vehicle device belonging to the Montana authorities, correct? Yes. I think you described it as a body wire type device. Correct. Okay. And um, is it correct that that device only lasts so long? Yes. It's a, typically they're a rechargeable device. Uh, you use it for, you know, to, you know, a lot of use for them would be to purchase narcotics. So it's a short term device. It only lasts, you know, you use it for one incident and you recharge it, download it, and use it again. So yes, it has limited battery life. Okay. And we already talked about the device that BCI brought with you to the Montana border, correct? Yes. And that was also installed in that vehicle? Yes, it was. And we have already heard a uh, tale of, of the quality of recordings. Um, did, were those devices ultimately removed from that vehicle? Yes, they were. And can you tell us uh, when and how that occurred? So those devices were inserted into the Suburban the, that the Wagners were traveling in. And so they came back to Ohio and they stopped at the border and, and uh, that's when we installed them. Then they came back to Ohio for a short period of time, a couple days, a week or so. Then they went back to Alaska. So when they traveled back to Alaska, uh, Billy, Angela, and the children were in the Suburban Jake and George were traveling with the trucks and trailers. Billy and Angela and the children went to the state of Washington, dropped that Suburban off. It, it then uh, went onto a ferry and was transported up to Alaska. When it was at the location to be transferred onto the ferry is when we contacted uh, the Washington State Patrol and they executed a warrant and retrieved those devices. Okay. Okay, referring you back to um, 2018 um, and Peterson Road, during 2018, was there a decision to search part of the property at 260 Peterson Road? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us um, why or how that decision came to be? Well, as we heard on, the, on some of the recordings from the T3s from 2017, uh, um, Angela specifically kept inquiring about a barn, which barn we were digging. I remember in the June of 2017 activity, we went there with the skid loader and the backhoe and we were digging around behind the, the main, the big barn on that property. So 
you know, she just seemed super concerned about where exactly we were digging on that property. So the fact that we still had not recovered the murder weapon, any of them, there's three of them that we're still looking for. Um, we also at that time believed that there were suppressors used. We had not recovered that. Um, we had done searches at multiple different locations affiliated with the Wagners, but they seemed the most concerned about that property. So that drug us back to that, that location. Okay. They seem most concerned about that property and specifically about which bar you were searching. Correct. Near. Okay. And so was there, as a result of that, um, a decision to revisit the barns located on 260? Yes, there was. Okay. And specifically, um, was there um, a belief as to which of the barns was most likely the most likely candidate for that type of thing, and specifically in regards to concrete, et cetera. Yeah, so we, had, we were aware, as you guys have previously seen from uh, our criminal intelligence analysts, that the new barn that we called the new barn um, behind the residence uh, appeared to be in different phases of construction throughout the investigation. So there was a concern, had, you know, had there been anything placed in a pole that was set as part of the foundation of that barn. So there was concerns about that because we had not went into that far into to actually digging into that area yet. Okay. And I believe you were present obviously when Ms. Evans Lage testified about the barn research that she had done and was that part of that um, was that barn research done in part because of this concern? Yes it was. Okay. And in the course of that discussion, um, was there some discussion of even tearing down that barn in order to get at anything that might be there? Yes. So, with again, with it being under the different stages of construction, the purchase of the of the concrete, the quickcrete, we were concerned that possibly the murder weapons had been buried underneath that barn. You know, specifically, was it put in concrete to set the poles that was used to erect anything in that barn, whether it be the uh, stalls or what, what have you? Okay. And um, did you, in fact, get permission from the then Attorney General to, if you had to, tear it down and then rebuild it, rebuild one for the Jack. current owner? This is the well, there's about to be. Well, it may be a leading question. Could you ask it a different way? I'm going to sustain the objection. Okay. What were the plans um, for that barn if, in fact, you needed to tear it down? If the investigative team felt like that was a, you know, a good option to tear that barn down and attempt to recover the murder weapons, we were told to do so. Okay, and so can you tell us, um, first of all, I want to um, double back to um, the first searches um, in June, the searches specifically June 14th and June 15th of 2017. Um, you also were present in the courtroom when portions of the um, interception conversations were um, played where there's a discussion about uh, the owner should tell us, you know, we need a search warrant. Objecting to the form of it? Yes. I'm literally just laying a foundation for my next question, Your Honor. She's trying to Your Honor, can we approach on this? Yes.
Thank you, Chair. Um, you have listened to the conversations that were intercepted in the 2017 interception warrant, correct? Yes. Okay. And specifically, do you recall there being discussions during those conversations regarding the search that was occurring at 260 Peterson Road on June 14th and June 15th of 2017? Yes, there was. Okay. And can you tell us, during those searches, um, was the homeowner cooperative with BCI? Very cooperative. Okay. You did not have a search warrant for the June 2017 search, correct? No, we did not. Okay. You had had, though, for the May 10th and May 12th, Yes. Okay. Um, so when you were present on June 14th and June 15th of 2017 at 260 Peterson Road, did you do so with the consent of the homeowner? Yes, we were granted consent to search the property. Okay. And in fact, um, was the homeowner communicating with any of the Wagners during? Yes. Do you know if the Wagners were, or the homeowner was communicating with the Wagners during that time period? Yes, he was. Okay. I'll open the objection to that question. I'm overruling the Okay, objection. thank you. And you guys were aware at the time that that was occurring, correct? Yes. Okay. And in fact, had you asked him to communicate with them? Yes. So at any point, did you tell the homeowner that you didn't need a search warrant or that one was going to arrive in the mail to him? No. Okay. All right. So back to 2018, where you were um, had these recurring or ongoing concerns about um, maybe there was some items that you missed in your first searches in this case, correct? Yes. Okay. And did you ultimately um, return to 260 Peterson Road to ascertain whether or not that barn needed torn down? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us the dates um, or what month uh, that occurred? October of 2018. Okay. And again, was this done with the knowledge and permission of the homeowner? Yes, it was. And can you tell us, um, upon re-examining the barn that you referred to as the new barn, um, was there a determination as to whether or not that needed to be torn down or uh, dug up in any way? And we determined we were not going to go that path. Okay. And why? It just didn't seem likely with what they what was present that things were buried under there. So uh, again, we didn't want to inconvenience the homeowner or the property owner any more than we had to. Um, obviously, you know, this was, uh, you know, we were on his property, so we were trying to minimize the intrusion. And um, it just at that time did not seem like a good place to start. And it, it would have been an expensive adventure and you know, tearing a whole barn down and replacing it. Okay. And specifically, um, the, um I want to say the floor of that barn. Um, was that a dirt or was that a concrete? It was a dirt floor. Okay. Okay. And so then um, did you guys turn your attention to uh, other barns on the property? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us specifically which barn? The, the big barn, the old barn, the main barn. And can you tell us, um, was there initial, uh, initially a uh, smaller group that went out and to, to look at that barn? Yes. Again, we were trying to minimize the intrusion on the current property owner. Okay. And as a result of that initial um, visit, was there a decision to uh, return 
with more personnel and different equipment to conduct a further search? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us why that occurred? So, so there's, there's several things that um, there was a cistern that was located in the old barn that had not been thoroughly searched at that time. And again, that was a better option to, to search it versus tearing down another barn. So this is one of the things that had not been done and we, it needed to be done. Okay. And was there something found on that initial search that also um, you based that decision on? On the 2018 search or the, the 17? 2018, sorry. Yes, there was a uh, shell casing removed from the cistern. And I should clarify, I say cistern, I'm not sure what that hole was, but it appeared to be a cistern. Okay. And were you aware, there, there's also what um, has been referred to as a well on that property, correct? Yes. And where was that well uh, located? It was closer to the house. Okay. And were you aware of that well during the 2017 search? I was aware of the well with the clear water in it. I was not aware of the cistern or hole in the in the original big barn. Okay. And you were aware that that well with the clear water <laughs> had been searched in 2017, correct? Correct. Okay. And what number is that? Digital JBW 3585. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you, and we'll link that up later with the um, digital number. So it's 3585? Yes. JBW? Yes. Okay. at, I don't have the state's exhibit number, I will provide that later, but it um, is digital number JBW um, 3585. Um, first of all, do you recognize that area? Yes, I do. And what is that? This is inside the original big barn on the property. This is one of the areas that the jury view took place that was that jurors walked through okay. during the jury view. And specifically, is that the area where the cistern was located? Yes, it is. Okay. And can you tell us um, in that picture where it would have been located? It's underneath this debris. Okay. It does not appear to be visible in those pictures. No, right? it's hidden and concealed. Okay. Okay, so you indicated that there originally was a small group that went out that there was a shell casing recovered from that cistern and then you returned with more equipment and, and more personnel, correct? Yes. And at this time, was that still done in a way such that media was not alerted to that? Yes, it was, a, it was another small group, but with different equipment. Okay, and specifically, um, what personnel were present? For the? For BCI. For the second time that we? Yes, the second okay. time, sorry. Uh, when we actually went into the cistern, present would have been myself, Special Agent Brian White, as well as members from the Franklin County Sheriff's Office dive team. And you were present um, during that search, correct? Yes, I was. Okay. And were you present then when um, any items were recovered or removed from that? Yes, I was. Okay. okay. Your Honor, I have no other questions of this witness at this time. 
defense may cross examine. questions. How are you today, sir? Good. You're the lead agent, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, what's the name of the new homeowner after transfer from Jake and George Wagner? Dwayne DeWeese. Dwayne DeWeese. Dwayne DeWeese. Correct. Okay. And um, you're telling us that he consented to the various searches that you just testified about. Every single one of them, yes. Okay. Did you have him sign a consent form? I don't think we did. But you asked him to monitor or to have conversations with, I should say. You asked him to have conversations with the Wagners about um, the searches that were going on. Yes, we, we advised him not to, to shy away from it, correct. Right, because you're looking for information, right? You're looking yes. for their reaction. Yes, you're using, very much so, yes. You're using him to further your investigation. We, the property, yes. All right. And uh, did you monitor the, monitor the conversations between the new homeowner and the, and the various wife? Yes, but I'm not sure if they were audio or text message. I would have to look at the records to actually tell you which one they were. But yes, they would have been monitored. Everything would have been monitored, audio or text messages being sent by right. the Wagner's phones. And... As the lead agent, are you aware that after the murders, uh, Jake set up a GoFundMe account asking for $20,000 Yes. to help with the legal fees concerning his daughter Sophie? I'm aware of the GoFundMe <coughs> account. I'm not sure exactly what the nature of it was, but yes, there was one reference his daughter, yes. All right, and that was on the computer, one of the computers seized during the various searches. There's detailed information about that, correct? There could be. I'm. I, I'm not aware of it. There could you're be. You're not aware. As the lead agent, you're not aware. I was made aware of that through the media. Through the media? So, yes. So neither you nor your agents discovered the information on one of the computers that you seized concerning the GoFundMe account? I can't testify to what they saw. I'm asking what you or other agents saw. I have no idea what other agents saw. I, I was not aware that there was information on that computer referenced the GoFundMe. I'm aware there was one. Okay. Are you aware of the amount? I'm not denying that it's not on there. It, could, it very well could be that there's a large amount of information on that computer. Understood. But your job as lead agent is to know all the things that are really important, correct? Yeah. All right. And so were you aware that on the computer there was a GoFundMe account set up by Jake and Angela Wagner? As I just stated, no, I was not. You described this, this, what was in this picture, as a sister. Well, what is a sister? Or what's your understanding of a sister? I'm not exactly sure what this hole was used for, but it appeared like there was water draining into it or collecting in it for some reason. I don't know if it was for livestock at some point, being it's an older barn. It very well could have been a well used for livestock. Or I don't know if it's collecting you know, manure or what it's for. I know what it was filled with, which was black water that you couldn't, you know, or sludge. It was filled with sludge and bricks. Appeared to have been there for a very long time. Yes. All right. Thank you, sir. No other question. Any redirect? Um, regarding this search and the communications with between the homeowner and the Wagners, um, was that just in regards to the June uh, 2017 search? Yes. There was no communication with the Wagners regarding the 2018 search of the sister, correct? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. And you were asked about this GoFundMe account, and you said you were aware of it, but how did you become aware of it? It was something that either the news had reported on or that had came up in a Facebook group. But you had not seen evidence of that on the laptop in the records that you searched or became aware of? I was not aware through the computer, correct. Okay. I have no other questions. Any further cross? Yeah, just
one or two questions. Um, do you know which Wagner, the homeowner, had communication with? I believe it was directly with Jake, if my memory serves me right. Hey, I don't have any George and Billy hey. referenced the barns that we were searching, or the area we were searching. Thank you. Further cross. Thank you, Judge. Um, and George was very much concerned about being sued by the new homeowner yeah, for possible destruction I'm being done on the property. Isn't that true? Question. I'll, I'll sustain the objection. Any further questions from the defense of this witness? No, thank you. Anything further from the state? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you may step down. Thank you, Con. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, lunch recess. I have 12 after 12 on this, so 115 will be the time you need to be back uh, to the jury room. You'll be brought up by court personnel from there while you're on break. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Do not permit anyone to discuss this case with you or in your presence. Do not form or express an opinion concerning this case. Uh, do not do any research at all concerning the case from any source at all. Do not listen to, view, or read any accounts or reports of this case from any source at all and have no contact with any of the participants in the trial, including parties, counsel, uh, or witnesses. Does this counsel for either party have anything else you wish to put on the record before we recess for me? No, thank you. No, Your Honor, thank you. All right, then we are in recess until 1.15.
name, specifically the defendant, as well as other members of his family, regarding digging up property that he previously owned. Uh, there's a recording. Uh, we were not allowed to play it, but in the recording, there was a discussion that we could get sued. There could be some legal issues because the Wagners did not notify the independent the landowner of uh, this investigation that was going on. We attempted to get into that line of questioning. Uh, I respect the court's ruling that uh, objection by the state was uh, sustained. I just want to proffer for the record, had we been permitted to ask that question, the witness would have testified that there was discussion that was recorded that the Wagners were concerned with legal problems with the new homeowner, Dwayne Weeks, and uh, that would have been developed on the cross, but, uh, but we were not permitted to, to ask that. I just wanted to proffer that for the record. Thank you. I would clarify that, Your Honor. First of all, that was played the other day for the court when the court was reviewing that in, in, under their Rule 106 argument. Um, and the court made its ruling. Also, um, George was expressing Jake's concern that they might, get, they might get sued. But that has nothing to do with Angela's concern and the George discussion about which barn, which barn, which barn. So, um, again, um, the court made its ruling, and that that whole tape actually already has been offered in this case. So this isn't an emotion, I'm just proffering for the record what the testimony would be for later for you. Thank you. Is there anything for the mm -hmm. uh, And we are adjourned until 1.15.
may be seated. Is the state ready to call this next witness? Yes, Your Honor. Is the defense ready? Yes. State ready to call this next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the state is going to recall Lieutenant Brian White. Solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer unto God. I do. You can see that the statement is Thank you, Your Honor. Welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be back. <laughs> um, can you go ahead and restate your name for the record, please? Uh, Lieutenant Brian White, the Madison County Sheriff's Office. And Lieutenant, I'm going to refer you back to, um, I know you've already provided us testimony that you were the lead crime scene agent in this case, correct? That's correct. And when various searches were done after kind of those initial crime scene searches, you were the ones that, uh, you were the person that they would ask to be present or help process the scene? Correct? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us, um, Lieutenant White, was there a time in 2018 when you revisited the address of 260 Peterson Road? Yes, there was. Okay. And can, do you recall what date that was? October 30th, 2018. Okay. And can you tell us, um, was it only one specific area on that property or did you conduct a search <coughs> of the whole property again? No, it was just one specific area um, in the barn on the property. Okay, and what what part, or was there a specific area of the barn? It was the in the back part of the barn, um, okay. furthest away from where the house was at. Okay. And why were you back there searching that? We had documented a cistern or a well there in previous searches, but we never we never to that point we hadn't searched it. Um, the so we went back on that day uh, with the proper equipment and the proper personnel to be able to search in that cistern that we had saw when we were there previously. Okay. And had there been recent activity out at that location to uh, um, another item found? That's correct. And tell us what that was. There was a cartridge case found uh, there at the cistern. Uh, that was turned over to me, and that's what prompted a uh, further search of that cistern area. Okay. And can you tell us on this date, um, did you ask for the assistance of another agency to help with this search? We asked the Franklin County Sheriff's Office dive team to assist us in searching the cistern. Okay. I'm going to um, show you what's been marked as state's exhibit triple D1, and this is 6871. Okay, and can you tell us please what we are looking at there? That's an overview photograph of that corner of the barn, and that shows where that concrete area is there, uh, the general area of where that cistern was at. Okay. And then State's Exhibit DD2. Which is? I'm sorry, the very next one. Oh, well, 6878. Triple D. Triple D. Triple D2. 6870. Correct. That's the same area that we saw in the overview photograph, but this photograph is just moving closer into the cistern area. And then triple D4, which is 6879. We're looking at a medium range photograph of the entrance 
that gets you the opening that gets you into where it will, the contents of that cistern that run that was underground. Okay. And can you describe? I mean, obviously we can see here in this picture, but can you describe um, the water that was in that? It was it had a lot of uh, debris, obviously, and it's obviously black uh, from years of being there uh, in that location. So. Okay. And so um, all the black kind of gunk that is out um, around that area, is this, this is after some of the items have been removed? That's correct. Okay. And specifically DD5, can you tell us what, oh, which is triple D5, 6880. Those, that's a photograph just showing the bricks that the dive team, uh, the diver, had removed from the cistern, um, um, along with some other items. <clears throat> but we just piled them all up, and allowed them to move more freely in that area. Okay. And um, DD9. Which is or triple D nine, which is six eight eight four. And what are we looking at there? That's more of a close up photograph of the opening that enters into that system. Okay. And Lieutenant, can you tell us um, during that search, um, what, were there any items of interest recovered from that cistern? Yes, there were. And can you tell us um, what those items were or that item? The main item of interest was <clears throat> an old or an older, um, like the handle of a D cell flashlight that was recovered by the uh, diver. Okay. And can you tell us in the process of this search how quickly that was discovered? It was basically about the same time they started. So it was very early. They didn't have to remove hardly anything to get to find it. Okay. Showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Triple D 15, which is 6875. And can you tell us what we're looking at there? Those are some of the items that were recovered by the diver, and that's just an overview photograph showing some of the items. Okay, and there appears to be maybe some bones there? Some bones. Um, the uh, flashlight handle, or the flashlight that I described earlier, some metal pieces, um, just miscellaneous items, bottles. Okay. And those were the items that were removed on that date from that uh, cistern at 260 Peterson Road? That's correct. And then um, Triple D 16, which is 6877. Those are the same items that we saw in the previous photograph, just a closer photograph, kind of a medium range showing. Um, those items described earlier. Okay. And then triple D 17, which is 6876. That's the flashlight handle that I described earlier. <clears throat> it's a close up photograph showing the condition it was in when it was recovered. And what were your observations of that, the condition of that object? It was obviously dirty and appeared to be exposed to some sort of heat at some point. Okay. Deformed like that. And triple D 18, which is 688, 6888.
That's a photograph with, <clears throat> we use, it's called an ABFO scale, and that's what you see, that L-shaped um, object with the numbers on it, it's called an ABFO scale, and that just shows the measurements of the object that you're photographing, and that's what you're seeing in this picture. Okay. And when you are referring to this as the handle, are you talking about the bottom part of a flashlight that you hold on to that doesn't contain the Correct, the light? area that you would grip. Okay. <coughs> okay, and so were there any other items pulled out of the cistern that day that um, was of interest in this case? No. Okay. And can you tell us um, why this particular object was of interest? It obviously was modified, uh, made into something that it wasn't originally made to be. Um, so it needed to be explored further to see exactly what it was. Okay. And can you tell us, um, did you uh, participate in that uh, further exploration? Yes. Okay, and tell us about that. I collected it and it was taken to BCI and there was a serial number located on the item and we were able to conclude based on the serial number and confirm that it was a mag light flashlight based on the serial number that was found on the item itself. Okay. And did you do anything else with that um, object um, prior to submitting it to another agency? Once <clears throat> it was confirmed that it was a flashlight, we could tell that it had been modified. It had some something inside of it, and we took it to a facility and had it x-rayed so we could see what was inside of it, and what was inside of it appeared to be or was two <clears throat> metal discs that were placed inside that metal container right there. Okay. And based on that, what did you do? We, as the investigative team, we spoke about what we had known about it so far, <clears throat> and we decided to contact the ATF laboratory and see if they would examine it further um, to see exactly if they could tell what it was. Okay. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Triple D uh, 28, which is uh, <coughs> 3A. Yeah. So you got a number on it? 3A. Let me see it. Say 3A. 3A. And if you can close up on that perhaps a little bit, please. And can you tell us what we are looking at there? That's the photograph of the x-ray from the x-ray machine. And what that's showing is are the uh, the dividers or the, the metal discs that are inside of that flashlight. Okay, and where did that um, x-ray occur? Was that at BCI or some other location? That was occurred at the uh, Tri-County Regional Jail. Okay. I'm going to hand you what has been marked as State's Exhibit Triple D 22. Um, if you could go ahead and look at that item and tell us what that item is. That's an envelope 
that says one 7.62 by 39 cartridge case from well at 260 Peterson Road. It's got my name on it and my initials, and it also has a laboratory sticker on it. Okay. And is that the um, cartridge casing that was recovered from that uh, cistern? That is correct. And if you could go ahead and open that up and uh, remove that item, please. And if you don't mind, uh, Lieutenant, with the permission of the court, I would ask you to show that to the, you know, walk in front of the jury. Any objections to that? If you could go ahead and remove it from the bag, please. And if you can kind of describe the, the condition of that. It's the uh, casing that is recovered at the well that was given to me and it's um, obviously it's not in new condition it's aged a little bit covered by some black material now what's been marked as triple D 23 and if you can um, go ahead and look at that and tell us what that is. <coughs> That's got an evidence tag on it. It's got my name on it and um, this is the flashlight or the uh, that we sent to the that we Submitted to the ATF laboratory. Okay. And if you could go ahead and open up that item as well. This is the actual box that it was packaged in. Um, it's got my name on it, <coughs> the date, um, and it's labeled as one modified Mac light recovered from well 260 Peterson Road. The actual item in the box. And again, Lieutenant, if you could just go ahead and step out and, and walk that in front of the jury. That's permissible.
And Lieutenant, is that the object that you recovered from the, or that was recovered from the cistern um, located at 260 Peterson Road on October 30th of 2018? That's correct. And can you tell us, um, are you the individual that submitted that to the ATF lab? Yes, I did. It was <clears throat> a few days afterwards that it was recovered. <clears throat> you have to make arrangements through a local field office. So we made arrangements through the Columbus field office of the ATF to be able to submit it to their uh, laboratory in uh, West Virginia. So once those arrangements were made, I drove it to the laboratory and submitted it to the laboratory and then waited until they did their examination, picked it up from the laboratory and drove it back to BCI and placed it back in the evidence. So the laboratory in West Virginia? That's correct. Okay. And Lieutenant, w w during this search, um, you talked about the number of bricks that were removed as well. Um, was there a point where the um, cistern was also pumped, uh, the fluid or the water, whatever you want to call that? We did that different times throughout the search. <clears throat> we, we would pump out the liquid using just a regular water pump or uh, like you'd pump out your basement with um, just to get the liquid down um, for the diver to be able to move around easier. I have no other questions for this witness. Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, defense may cross examine. Thank you, Judge. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant White, right? Yes, sir. And it's Lieutenant because you're no longer with PCI, right? That's correct. When did you begin that new position? January of 2019. Okay, so have you stayed involved in this case as, as in regard to any updates of information? Yeah, as far as, yes. Okay, all right. And so uh, in regard to this uh, mag light makeshift suppressor that was found in that cistern. Yes. Are, are you aware that Jake Wagner um, has said that I'm he made Jack that? Basis of Co-defendant. I'm sorry. Oh. Well, it, it's a statement against criminal made, interest. If we could approach on this,
anybody has provided any information about that device to Your Honor, again, to I'm going to object to that question. I just ask if he's aware of any information. Well, I'll let him answer that question. I'm not aware of any information. Okay. <coughs> any redirect? No. Can I step down? Thank you. Call this next witness. Um, yes, Your Honor. The state would call um, Sean Foy to the stand. showed Special Agent Scheider an exhibit that had a digital number, JBW3585. It was from the uh, May 10th, May 10th uh, search of 260 Peterson Road. That exhibit number is AA38. Right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer unto God? I do. You see State my exam. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you please state your name and go ahead and spell your last name for the record? Sean Floyd. Last name is Floyd, F L O Y D. Okay. And, Mr. Floyd, where are you employed? The Franklin County Sheriff's Office. Okay. And can you tell us what what is your current assignment with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office? I'm a patrol, uh, patrol deputy on second shift. Okay. And how long have you been with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office? It'll be ten years in uh, January. Okay. And has your assignment always been to be a patrol? You start off at uh, the Sheriff's Office, well, Franklin County Sheriff's Office, and corrections, and then kind of go out from there. So. Okay. So you started in the corrections, which yep. is basically working in the jail. Yep. Okay. And then at what point did you become uh, a patrol? Uh, 2017. Okay. <clears throat> do you also have other assignments with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office? I do. Um, and is one of those related to dieting? It is. Okay. And go ahead and talk to us a little bit about um, how you got to be on the uh, Franklin County uh, dive team and what all is involved in that? Um, the dive team is only a secondary team or a specialty team. Uh, it is part-time, but you do have to try out for it and everything. And basically some people make it, some people don't. I've been on the team for, I believe, well, on seven years now. Okay. Um, that's pretty much the gist of it. Um, we get called out. We are fairly funded, so we can get called out anywhere in Frank County, let alone anywhere in the state of Ohio or even other states for that matter. Okay. You said you're federally funded? Mm -hmm. Okay. And can you tell us um, where do the majority of your calls come from? They actually, a lot of them are southern Ohio, um, but we've been here multiple times, uh, been to Ohio River, pretty much you name it, we've probably been there. So. Okay. And can you tell us what kind of training um, do you have to have or certifications, etc., in order to do that, to be a member. Of that so, to get on the team, you just have a to get on the team. You have to have a open water certification, which is just one simple certification. I, however, have about 14 different certifications in dive, ranging from dry suit, you know, drift diving, 
mine diving, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ones. So. Okay. And can you tell us, um, basically, when you are called out to do a search, how, how, do you, how is that conducted? We basically call out from another county or jurisdiction um, stating, you know, we're looking for a body, evidence, you know, whatever it may be. And then this goes through our chain of command, and then we get called out to the location. Okay. And once you're at the location, how is it determined, um, you know, what body of water you're going to enter, how that search is going to be conducted, et cetera? Obviously, we don't want to step on toes. So when we're at these places, especially out of county, it's a large-scale operation. There's multiple jurisdictions there. And, you know, when you have a lot of people there, it can kind of get hectic at times, but usually there's a chain of command there as well, and we kind of go to them and, you know, see what they need, because we're there basically to help. Okay. And regarding a case here in Pike County, um, were you called to assist, or was the Franklin County dive team, um, Sheriff's Office dive team, called to assist um, during the course of this investigation, actually on more than one occasion? Yes. Okay. And were you one of the members of the dive team that responded to that request? I was. Okay. And specifically, I'm going to focus your attention today on um, a location known as 260 Peterson Road where there was a cistern that was uh, requested to be searched. Were you one of the um, team members that responded to that location? I was. Okay. And can you tell us what your recollection is of that uh, search? Uh, we first got there, uh, we were told it was going to be inside of a barn. Once we got inside the barn, we located what was believed to be the well or cistern, and it was covered up with debris, wood, you know, boards, that type of stuff. Um, once we removed the boards from the hole, it was it looked like just a, a muck mess. Um, we decided on who was going to dive, and that was me. And once I got in there, the water was roughly about say knee to mid thigh uh, depth and then found it to be a solid bottom which was later found to be bricks um, at that time we decided that you know to do a proper search we have to you know, remove the bricks from the well or the cistern uh, we removed I'd say approximately 200 bricks from the um, cistern and during which time we found multiple different things from wire bottles uh, animal remains as well as a metallic or metal cylinder object in the well. Okay. And turning your attention to that cylinder um, object um, that you're referring to, and I'll, I can show you pictures here in a, a moment, but um, can you tell us in the course of your search, how quickly or not did you find that particular object? I believe it was in the first half of the search. Um, I believe a few bricks have been removed already from the well, but it was found during that time. Okay, you said a few bricks have been? I believe so. Okay, um, but not all 200 bricks. <laughs> I don't believe it was that, that far. Okay, um, and that was one of the first objects that you found? Correct. Correct, okay. Um, go ahead and put triple D1 up, which is 6871. And can you tell us what we're looking at there? This is going to be the entrance to the barn, and to the left, there's kind of like a slab there. I think, um, I can't tell on that, if that picture, if that's where the hole is at right there, it looks like it is. It's kind of dark on my uh, end here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, let me go to uh, DD4, which is 6879. So that would be the cistern that we located all the objects in, including the, the cylinder. Um, as you can see on the left there, that's half the bricks that I've already taken out, as well as on the far right side, there's some bricks there still. Okay. And there's a yellow object in that um, to the right of the um, hole there. Um, can you tell us what that is? The thing, the, the bag on the bottom right would be a rope bag. just for me. 
okay. like I say, for assistance in getting in and out of the hole. And then the other yellow slash gray object to the right is a metal detector. Okay. And those were things that you brought with you or the team brought with you. Correct. And can you tell us, um, Deputy Floyd, did you actually have to uh, submerge yourself in that muck? Yeah, I was fully submerged. And you searched the entire uh, cistern or well? Yeah, when we were first in there, um, like I said, it was roughly about uh, mid-thigh depth. And by the time we were all said and done, it was approximately, I'd say, 15 feet deep. Okay. And later in your search, um, was the, was the, uh, the water or <laughs> fluid in that um, hole pumped out? About halfway through the search, uh, we realized that there's a lot more water in there than what we originally were working with. Um, so we were able to get a waste pump in there, and we actually pumped out the remaining water with that. Okay. And again, this was after you'd already found that cylinder. Correct. Object, correct. Okay. And then I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Triple D-17. Um, 6876 is the digital number. And Deputy Floyd, if you could look at that and tell me if you recognize that object. Uh, that's the metallic or metal cylinder that I recovered from the hole. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and show you Triple D-16 which is 6877. And can you tell us if you recognize those objects? Yep, those were all objects that were recovered from the cistern. Okay. There appear to be bones. I, I assume those are not human remains. I hope not. That was a small human then. <laughs> Pretty small, yes. Okay. It appeared to be an animal of some sort, correct? Yes. Okay. And other than the items that are pictured here, um, were there any other items of interest that were recovered from the cistern on that date? I'm, I don't believe so. I think that was everything we had. Okay. And again, you did, you did respond um, to another request uh, for a search in this case, correct? I did. Okay, at a later date, mm -hmm. correct? Okay. Okay. I am going to ask you to look um, in a box that was removed from State's Exhibit Triple D23. Um, and just go ahead and open that and just tell me if that, if you recognize that. I do. And what do you recognize that as? The same object that was pictured in the picture in front of me. It's the same uh, cylinder that I recovered from the well. Okay. Okay, I have no other questions, Your Honor. All right. Defense can we cross examine? Yeah. Thank you. You may step down. Colts next witness.
Um, Your Honor, the state would um, recall Special Agent Scheidor for a few questions. Sworn earlier today, I, this isn't continuous testimony, so I am going to ask you to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer unto God? I do. The state may go. Um, Special Agent Schneider, um, did you, you already testified that you were present for this search. Um, of this cistern or well or hole in the ground um, at 260 Peterson Road in that barn, correct? Yes. The old barn. And you were present when that object was taken out of that uh, cistern, correct? Yes, I was. And can you tell us, um, there was testimony that there was a serial number um, on that object, correct? Yes, there was a visible, uh, identifiable serial number on the body of the object. Okay. And did you use that serial number to obtain additional information regarding that object? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us specifically, did you um, obtain information about the um, date that that was manufactured? Yes. And can you tell us what that date was? It was in January of 2016. And I'm going to hand you what's been marked as triple D31. And if you can just tell us uh, what that is. The first page of triple D31 is a grand jury subpoena that I served on MAG Instruments out of California. And it's requesting information on the MAGLite body that we recovered from the well with the listed serial number. And it's just asking for records related to that, that, that item. Okay, and what is the second page then? The second page, and the, the subpoena was served uh, in November 1st of 2018. And the response was an email response back from uh, Roy Anderson, who is an attorney representing MAG Industries. Uh, and it says, that the Maglite flashlight in question was manufactured on January 13, 2016 and was a model 2SD incandescent and it was never registered with Mag Instruments Inc. and we have no record of any warranty or repair actions regarding it. And then they provided screenshots uh, reference that serial number in their record system. Okay. I have no other questions, Sharon. The defense may cross-examine. Sir, I just have a few questions for you. You were here while the forensic accountant had testified, right? Yes. You heard his testimony? I'm going to object to this beyond direct. And if you have yeah, permitted. Yeah. If it's relevant to the case and we don't get into any other impermissible questioning. Sure. So, sir, as I was asking, you heard the testimony of the person accountant, right? Yes. And the accountant testified to purchases that were made? Yes, several purchases, yes. And do you recall the forensic account accountant testifying to a mag maglite diesel solvent trap combo that was purchased? Yes. And that was through Amazon? Maybe uh, not. <laughs> I would need the record to see exactly where the purchase was at. And do you recall that witness saying that that purchase was made by Jake Wagner? I believe that Jake Wagner's financial things, yes. Thank you. Okay. State may redirect if it wishes to. I have no redirection. Thank you, Your Honor. State may call us next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. State of Ohio will call Janeville Barwood to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms.
ask you to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer unto God? So help me God. State may examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, would you state your name for the record and spell it, please? It's not James Barlow, uh, J A M E S B A R L O W. And Mr. Barlow, would you tell the jury your employment, please? I work for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Um, in this case, I was a, a firearms enforcement officer in Martinsburg, West Virginia. And if you would, uh, have you taken a different job or received a promotion since then? So, since I was a firearms enforcement officer, and now I'm uh, actually the the, uh, the branch chief for the firearms enforcement officer development branch. So, one of my primary uh, responsibilities is training new firearms enforcement officers. And if you would, would you mind telling the jury what a uh, firearms enforcement officer does? So, the the easiest way to explain it is. Um, if you have a device or, or a suspected firearm, uh, what we do is it can, it can be sent to us and we will look at it and determine uh, if it is in fact a firearm or whatever device it may be and then we will uh, categorize it uh, according to federal laws and regulations so everybody has a, the, the correct idea of what, what you're actually looking at, if that makes sense. Hey, Mr. Barlow, how long have you worked for alcohol, tobacco, and firearms? Uh, six and a half years. Okay. Hey, if you don't mind, would you mind uh, telling the jurors, they should give them an overview of your career that led up to the uh, your position at ATF? Sure. So, um, roughly since 1986, that's when I graduated high school, went in the Navy. Uh, since 1986, all the way through until today, I've had some kind of employment that relates to firearms in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Uh, a lot of maintenance, operation, repair. Um, I was gunner's mate in the Navy for quite a while. And then after that, I did some uh, work for various uh, Department of Defense uh, entities. Um, I was a small arms repairer for the Department of Army. I worked for Department of State as a contractor. Um, the Florida Highway Patrol, I was their armor for two years. And I had an FFL, a federal firearms license at, at one point in time. So I was a gun dealer and I uh, worked some security jobs, things like that. And then I got hired at ATF in uh, 2016. Hey, do you have any type of uh, specific training or, ex or experience that enables you to hold the uh, job of a firearms enforcement officer? other than what you mentioned there, and maybe specific classes and those type of things? Right, so um, as a firearms enforcement officer, when you get hired, you come in, you're basically on like an OJT program for a year, year and a half. A lot of people get hired in to have, have firearms experience, um, skills, you know, working with firearms, that kind of thing. Um, you do a deep dive into what the regulations and laws are uh, pertaining to firearms because that's that's our job is to classify and uh, along with that you go to a lot of armor schools where you go to whatever factory it is um, Colt Smith and Wesson etc Ruger and you you go to their their training that they have teach you how to work on whatever their particular firearms are I've also um, had classes like that of course in the in the military and one of the, the, the most unique uh, aspects of a fire enforcement officer training is we also deal with silencers, firearm silencers. So we get training on how to operate uh, the, the equipment, so special test equipment, to determine a decibel reduction between an unsilenced firearm and a silenced firearm, how many decibels the silencer actually will reduce the, the noise, the sound from the, uh, the firearm. And uh, along with that, you learn a lot about how to how how firearms are assembled. I mean, not firearms, uh, silencers are assembled, features and characteristics of those, and we actually do. We built one of our own silencers ourselves, kind of a home homemade uh, silencer as part of the training. Hey, what, sir, you mentioned the uh, you know, armor schools. How many of those would you? Uh, say you've been to over the course of your career? Um, I believe 
I ballpark around 25, but a lot of them more than once, some two and three times. Because the certifications typically last for about three years, and then you have to go back and recertify again because it's a, it's a factory certification. So they want to make sure you get updated to the, the latest uh, whatever model firearm they have. They made changes to it. You have to be up to speed on, on the new new types and new firearms. And you also mentioned you had some specific training involving uh, silencers. Would you tell us what that training was, sir, other than what you've already talked about? So a uh, silencer, um, it's a different kind of device. It's still classified as a firearm in the, uh, under the Gun Control Act. But it's not anything that actually fires a bullet or anything like that. So the way we, we uh, classify those, how do you determine what is and is not a silencer, how it's not a piece of water pipe or something else? We have to learn the features and characteristics of what a silencer possesses and how it works to do what it does. And along with that, we'll use the, uh, the training and the, the basic acoustics of training is what it is. And uh, we use the, the silencer test equipment we have and we'll determine, make a determination on what the, the decimal reduction is and we'll test the, the gun with and without the silencer on it. Of note though, a silencer does not have to necessarily reduce the report of the firearm. It doesn't have to quiet it down to still be classified as a, as a uh, silencer because you're basing silencer classification specifically on the features and characteristics of one. Hey, we get that. Have a specific uh, silencer training. Uh, were you required to take any tests or have any certifications for it internally with the ATF or anywhere else? To, to be a, a, a certified firearms enforcement officer, once you complete all your training, you go to a, a like a board where you get asked questions and you know you have to get the you know you have to answer the questions correctly or else you won't be certified. Once you're certified and you're fully signed off on, you get a letter of certification saying that you're a certified firearms enforcement officer. And sir, when were you first certified to be a firearms enforcement officer with ATF? I'd have to ballpark that probably. 2017 sometime, roughly, I think a year, year and a half after I started working there. And if I use the term silencer, suppressor, muffler, are all of those the same thing, referring to the same thing? Yes, typically. The suppressor is um, like an industry term. Um, the, the statute actually calls uh, it's a firearm silencer or muffler. You'd also indicated you had that training on devices to examine silencers. I think you might have mentioned x-ray scanners, something like that. Would you tell us a little bit about that? So what we do is, is if we have something, so a silencer when it comes in, it may be when you fire a gun through a silencer, a lot of carbon and other stuff builds up on the inside. And so usually you can screw the ends off and uh, take the inside parts out if there are any. Um, a lot of times they may be, it, the whole device may be duct taped around or whatever in such a configuration that you can't, you can't disassemble it. So t usually we, when we get it, we'll look at it from the exterior uh, and then take it apart, disassemble it, look at what's on the inside to check for the, the features and characteristics of a silencer. And if we can't disassemble it, or and if we think we, if we disassemble it, it will no longer be, you know, it'll lose its integrity, fall apart, whatever. We can't test it or leave it in basically the same condition as when we received it. We won't test it or we won't uh, disassemble it. So we can take it to an x-ray machine, take an x-ray of the outside, and it'll show you pretty much what's on the inside. Cavities, baffles, you know, whatever components there may be in there. As well as we have a bore scope which is a typical bore scope like you would use to look at a, uh, the inside of a firearm barrel if you're looking for any problems or anything like that with it. Um, we can run the bore scope inside the device and take photos of the inside if need be. So there's, those are the other alternate ways we make a determination about a silencer if we can't disassemble it. Hey, Mr. Barlow, how many uh, silencers if you can maybe give me an approximate number, have you examined in your career with the ATF? Oh, wow, that's a lot. Um, just ballparking, I'd have to say probably 300 there about, maybe more. Sometimes we'll get batches of 10 or 15 of the same kind, so we'll look at one of those and, you know, they're all the identical, but 
I've done a lot of silencers. And have you ever uh, testified before about uh, silencers in court? Yes. Have you ever been recognized as an expert in any court in the field of silencers and firearms? Yes. And where was that, sir? Uh, many places as a, a federal in federal court. Never in state court. Be your first time testifying in state court on something? Yes, sir. Okay. Your Honor, if I may, I would ask the court, based on Mr. Barlow's training, experience, prior testimony, his designated as a, and his designation as an expert in the field of firearms and silencers, in the federal court, would he be designated as such by this court today? Any objections to that? The court will. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Counsel. And you've talked about silencers a little bit. Let me ask you this. In the course of your career, have you ever seen a homemade silencer? Not many. Okay. Would you tell us what a homemade silencer is? A uh, homemade silencer, it, typically it's a, it's a tube-like device, as they pretty much all are. Um, you can go to the hardware store, something like that, and buy a lot of different parts and pieces, and people will put those together in some fashion. Um, it depends on the, the whoever's making it, their, their mechanical abilities and their skills. Uh, you can look at find stuff on the internet, it's not hard to do. Um, to put together something that's not, it's not manufactured by an actual licensed uh, silencer manufacturer. Anything else would be a homemade silencer, or now we call them a privately made firearm, which silencers are technically firearms. Um, it's something that an individual puts together uh, and they it's up to them to design it however they want to there's a lot of a lot of information a lot of different ways you can build a silencer to do different things and it's up to the uh, the maker to pick and choose so a homemade silencer is whatever you can imagine uh, it's there's no limit to what you can do what you can uh, the, the features and characteristics you can add to it other uh, material you can add to try and get it to do what you want it to do, which is reduce the report of the firearm. Have you been involved in investigations in the past uh, involving homemade or home manufactured silencers? Yes. Okay. I said, uh, and you're familiar with something called Operation Silent Night? Correct. Yes, sir. And can you tell me what that is? So uh, Operation Silent Night is a, it's a homeland security investigation basically directed at um, items that are marketed uh, on the internet usually as uh, inline fuel filters is the big one. They, they call them inline fuel filters which are what it amounts to is it's a silencer that just hasn't had the holes drilled in the center all the way through. So there's some uh, some folks think that that's, uh, that makes it not a silencer which is not the case at all but um, Silent Night was geared specifically toward so all of these the devices we're speaking about that are in Silent Night were typically imported from China, so it's an effort to try and stop the basically the illegal importation of firearm silencers into the United States. Okay. And is it um, based on your training and experience? I'd like to move on to maybe the types of uh, types of silencers. Is it possible to make a silencer out of a mag light? Absolutely. Would you tell us how that works, sir? So a mag light flashlight is fairly common. Uh, it was so is the precursor um, to. It's a homemade silencer. They've been around quite a while, and the the, the process is is well documented online. You can find it, and the the way you make those has been it's tried and true. Um, they work quite well. What you would do is you could take and uh, purchase a maglite flashlight, uh, different sizes, it doesn't matter really. And usually what people would do is buy it. It's, uh, their uh, expansion plugs or freeze plugs for a, a car engine. Um, if you don't know what that is, there's uh, the interior, when, when a, a car engine block is cast, it has sand in there and so then the, they have to have holes to let everything out. And then once it's in the water jacket area, typically. So once you have the engine block ready to be assembled into an engine, you have to block those holes off. So 
they're, they're usually round holes and you have what they call a freeze plug. It's kind of a concave looking round plug that sticks in the hole. And it just so happens that there are, there are different sizes of those and there are a few different sizes that correspond to the interior diameter of maglite flashlights. So if you know which flashlight size you're using, you can find it online and say, well, you'll need this particular freeze plug by this manufacturer and it fits. It's a, usually a, a tight fit, but it'll fit inside the, uh, the, the flashlight too. Well, once you put your, so that once you would drill a hole in it, put it inside the tube, you press it in, that becomes a baffle. That's one, one of the features of a, a firearm silencer is a baffle. Much the same as a, uh, a car muffler or a, a lawnmower muffler or anything like that. You have the, like a lawnmower muffler that's a, uh, it's a cylindrical shape uh, a lot of times and there's uh, baffles inside so when the gases flow through, the exhaust gases flow through, it basically what a, a it's just like a car muffler, a firearm silencer, firearm muffler, what it does is it slows down the gases flowing through and it just makes them take longer to, to go through. It's just retarding the flow through the device. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into it but I, I'm sure I'll explain it later on. But so you, you put the, uh, the baffles inside the maglite tube and then you can purchase end caps for it or you can drill and tap your own with a, um, a tap or, uh, to cut threads inside of the, the end caps. But you can buy a kit of uh, front and rear end caps they call them. One end will be threaded that's to whatever size the uh, firearm barrel would be. There's some, some, some typical sizes. and. You screw that on the rear end of the flashlight with the, the baffles inside, the, the, the um, freeze plugs, and then you put the other cap on the front end. Well, on the, the front end, you typically you drill a hole in that to suit the size of the, the caliber of whatever firearm you're putting on, because you want the hole to be as close to the size of the bullet as possible, makes the device more efficient. And so once you do that, you put in your baffles, um, screw on the two end caps, drill your hole in the front, and uh, attach it to the barrel and you're done. Uh, if there's a if there's a uh, firearm that has a barrel that's uh, not one of the more standard thread sizes, you can either thread that barrel or you can get a threaded adapter a lot of times. And so you put, put the adapter on the barrel and then the device, the silencer, onto the threaded adapter. Um, it's also possible you can find uh, adapters that go on firearm barrels that don't require threads. They will hook around the, the front sight or there's set screws in it and then you adapt the, the barrel that way without actually having to put threads on the barrel. Hey, just as an example, I'm not gonna do here this in evidence or anything, but it's basically just a regular off the shelf mag light. Just maybe just tell us what that is for maybe just in case nobody's seen one before. Okay, so yeah, so this is a this is a it's a 2D cell Maglite flashlight, one of the common sizes. You know, you can get them longer up to I think 5 5 cells and they have extensions. So um, you want me to talk about this particular flat? I mean, as far as like dissembler or anything or Yeah, I was going to say actually uh basically if I if I wanted to uh assume I didn't want to run a foul of your office or anything like that, how would I turn that into a suppressor? Just physically? How you would go about it? Yes. So, that's what I was telling you about before. You just screw the end off. You know, like it, I think everybody's seen the flashlight when the batteries go. You can take this end cap off. Um, these end caps, you could, you could uh, thread this, drill a hole in it, run a tap in and thread it, but it's pretty thin. So one of the one of the key elements of the the firearm silencer being connected to the firearm itself is that the barrel the barrel has the bore that goes straight through that the bullet flies through. And if you're hooking you're hooking a, uh, a silencer to that bore, you want it to be in line with it because clearly if you have it you know angled off a little bit like that and the projectile comes through, it's not going to go it's not going to turn the corner and go out the device. So it needs to be in line so that the projectile won't hit anything when it goes through. That's one of the down, downsides of trying to thread the actual maglite rear end cap because they're, they're fairly thin and it won't necessarily give you a good purchase. 
on the uh, the barrel, it could be you know out of alignment. Then all you have to do is remove the, uh, the the head of it. There's a snap ring in here. You pop out the snap ring. This is the switch part and the bulb. This is the working parts of it. You, all this comes out as one piece. And then the uh, the aftermarket uh, end caps that I was telling you about. One screws on here. One screws in the end. And the, the one in this end usually is the one that's threaded for a firearm barrel. And that's essentially it. You can take uh, the freeze plugs I was talking about. You take those line. You can drill holes in them. You just put it down on a use the two before whatever. Put it in a vise. Drill the hole whatever size you want it to be in the middle. Put it in the end of the tube and hammer it in. You want to have a tight fit so they don't fall over. Or you can use spacer material. Different ways. To go. There's a lot of different ways you can go about it. And uh, you just press them in and put the caps on. And you're talking about freeze plugs. And just for purposes of illustration, um, hold one or two of those up for the jury. Just sure. So this is what I was mentioning was the freeze plug. See, it's kind of concave. You have the inside and the outer side. So these will get pressed into an engine block to keep the water in and the water jackets, what they're, what they're used for. Um, very commonly used in making silencers because they come in, I think it's um, boxes of 10. And then, and like I said, the, the sizes, there's a lot of different sizes of freeze plugs to correspond to a lot of different kind of engine blocks, different sizes. And um, if you look online, you can find out which size fits what what uh, flashlight tube. There's uh, two main brands, Dorman, and I can't think of the other one right off the top of my head. But um, then you drill your hole in this, put it here, and this one drops in pretty good. What you'll do is you'll stack those up now. It's what we call a baffle stack. You'll have one on top of another one on top of another one uh, through the device. Probably can't make this, just like, but essentially you'll line them up like that inside the flashlight and just make a, a big baffle stack. Um, there also is a, you can take and get a thin wall uh, pipe, cut it to make spacers. And so you can space, you put more space in between each baffle. Uh, one, is, one school of thought, and it's, it's true, there's different ways to go about it. Like I said, there's a lot that goes into making a silencer, but if you put spaces in between the baffles themselves, it also can increase the efficiency of the, the resulting silencer, the device, uh, especially if you have a, uh, a wider space, a longer empty chamber at the, the muzzle end where the barrel comes into the silencer you want to have a bigger chamber on a, on a rifle size device so that it has more room for the gas to expand before encountering baffles due to the, the large volume of pressure and gas. So um, the tube itself makes an expansion chamber which is the key part of a, of a firearm silencer. You need the, the expansion chamber. Think of all the gases that are inside the rifle barrel. The bullet comes out and right behind it, you have all those the, the burning gas, burning propellant come out. That's what makes the actual noise, the report, and the big, you know, you see the flash when a, a, somebody fires a firearm, you see the flash, you hear the noise of that. Well, what a silencer does in a nutshell is all those gases come inside of the device and they just, it's milliseconds, but it makes a difference. Basically, you're retarding the flow out. They come inside the, the silencer, the the gases flow in here, expand and cool. I know it sounds odd that you think it's going to be there long enough to actually cool off, but it does. The cooler it can get and the more it can continue to burn the propellant before it's released into atmosphere because in the atmosphere you have a lot of uh, oxygen. So you're putting a superheated burning propellant gases into an oxygen rich atmosphere makes the report of the firearm, the noise that you hear whenever it goes bang, the bang part of it. Uh, so that's the expansion chamber. That's the, the whole premise behind a silencer is you want an expansion chamber. Baffles just segregate the expansion chamber into smaller expansion chambers. So instead of going straight through, which it would still work like that, that will make, give you a, a decimal reduction. Think of the baffles as being like you're walking down the street on the sidewalk and then you come up to a set of steps. You're moving along when you hit the steps you're going to start working your way up, it slows you down, and then eventually you get to the top, 
and then you continue on at the, the speed you were going before. Baffles are just like steps on a stairwell that slow, you slow down the gases as they're moving through the device. I think I beat that to death. <laughs> During the course of your duties with the uh, ATF, I'm going to hand you a smart ex states exhibit DDD 23. I'm going to ask you if you've ever seen the uh, states exhibit DDD 23 before. You want to put this back together? Or just get it out of your way. We can do that later. You don't have to. States exhibit DDD 23 before. I have. And where have you seen it, sir? At my office in Martinsburg, West Virginia. And how was it that uh, that item came into your possession? Um, it was arranged for us to examine it to determine if it was, in fact, a silencer or a, a parts of a silencer. Mr. Wilson, if you would, I'd like to put up States Exhibit. FFF2, and it will be page 2 of the, uh, just one second, there will be a picture pop up on your monitor, Mr. Burley. I'm going to take this out, or leave it hey, If you want to, with the, if you're comfortable, there's gloves if you... No, I'm good. <laughs> See, States Exhibit FFF2, the picture you're looking at right there, Mr. Barlow. What is that? So that's that's this uh, this device right here. Okay. Um, what did you do with that device to determine uh, you know, whether it was a silencer functioning or anything else? So when I first got it, uh, there had already been a report written by another FEO that said it was, a, in fact, a, a combination of parts from which a silencer could be assembled or was a silencer at one time. And I just did a reinvestigation because she's no longer with our reexamination because she's no longer with us. Um, and when did you do your reexamination? When? Yes, sir. I, I don't remember. Um, it's in my report. Okay, it said that 2021, would that ring a bell? Sounds about right, yeah. And tell, again, tell us what you do to examine that item. So with everything we get, all the evidence that comes in, we'll take and uh, look at it, do a quick uh, visual examination, see what we see. If there's anything that jumps out, you know, okay, that's something I need to, to look further into. Uh, same with the firearm. Take photos of it, and then we'll, if it's something we can operate, we'll, you know, try and function it or whatever. But uh, this clearly is not functional as is. But... Um, I noticed, I read the, the other report, and so clearly they, they had already stipulated that it was, in fact, a uh, firearm silencer. So I was just going through looking at it myself. I noticed right away, which is fairly common, this is a switch hole with a, uh, from a maglite flashlight. Typically when somebody makes a, a uh, silencer out of a flashlight, you're always going to have the switch holes left open. So sometimes it'll be wrapped in duct tape, electrical tape, or you could get a spacer sleeve to put inside the, the spacer, the thin wall pipe I was talking about, and it'll block that hole off because you don't want your gases escaping until it's gone the whole length of the device. Um, here, looking at too, uh, this appears to be from the outside a a freeze plug that's been drilled. Um, if you see, there's another hole off to the side right there. That's common. A lot of times you'll find another hole, a series of holes all the way around or just some on opposite sides when people are making baffles. Again, a million different ways you can design your particular silencer. Um, also, on this side, there's a serial number, and Maglite flashlights have a serial number. You can call the company and they'll tell you when it was made. They, they track this mostly for um, warranty purposes, not necessarily like a firearm where they can tell you where it went, who bought it, or anything like that. Mr. Wilson, if you would, would you bring up uh, states exhibits, states exhibit triple F three, which is page three? Right. And sir, you indicated you obviously located that uh, 
serial number on that particular Magalite, and you talked a little bit about it. As far as uh, the picture up there, is that what is? Uh, does that truly and accurately reflect the serial number as you found it on there? Yes. Right. Did you have to do uh, any particular process to raise it or scrape anything off of it or anything to locate that number? Uh, I don't recall if I had to do anything for this. So I may have like rubbed it with a cloth or uh, ran a, like a light brush over it or something, but. Usually you can see the uh, the numbers, and one thing I might have done, I don't remember in this particular case, you can take chalk and run over the serial numbers and it'll raise them up. The white color of the chalk will be inside the uh, the digits of the numbers. Mr. Russell, would you put up State's Exhibit Triple F, number four, please, which will be page four of the PowerPoint text. And you previously talked about a switch hole, Mr. Barlow, is the... Uh, picture depicted on the screen what you're referring to yes and what else did you do with your examination so as I said I, I noticed that this appeared to be a freeze plug baffle in the front and in the rear you notice the cut part here it looks like a also the same thing the interior portion of a freeze plug odds are spectacular that it would be since that's what's in the front it'd be a freeze plugs all the way through and that's a common way to make a mag light silencer so if you notice this this is a washer inside the freeze plug at the rear and it has the two holes that i was talking about on the the outside of the main center hole i, I requested to be able to uh remove that and look at the markings because typically a, a freeze plug is marked on the the inside as to what size it is in the manufacturer and as far as the front in the photo here you can see this part is bent forward and it's kind of pushed out. It would normally typically be kind of flat, maybe a little concave, but flat. Which this is uh, indicative of what we call a baffle strike. Whenever you fire a, a gun with a silencer on it and the projectile is not necessarily lined up with the bore, it'll veer, well, it, it's going in a straight path, but the baffle is in the, the path of the bullet. The bullet will strike the, the, the edge of the, uh, the baffle and deform it. And it looks just like that. And obviously you've talked about um, your training experience you've put together uh, in suppressors and your coursework there. How hard is it to get something like that lined up perfectly so you don't have a baffle strike like that? So it can be, it can be fairly difficult to, to get it lined up where it will function in its most efficient manner. If you remember, uh, the idea behind it is you want the center hole to be as close as possible to the diameter of the bullet that's going through it because what the the baffle is designed to do to allow the projectile to pass through but all the, the gas that's following it coming out of the gun barrel you want to slow those down as much as possible so the best way to make the gases go slower is have the smallest hole you can have so if you drill the hole in the manner that the, the device will be its most efficient where it's really close to the size of the bullet then if the, the device is not lined up exactly perfectly with the bore of the firearm, the potential for a baffle strike is greatly increased. What some people will do is drill a much larger hole in the center, and it gives you some wiggle room in, in the event that you know the threading, whatever the, uh, the uh, adapters that you may have, they're not necessarily machined all that well. Uh, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. So if you, build, if you drill a bigger hole through the device, then the bullet is less likely to hit a baffle on the way through. Hey, do you encounter baffle strikes uh, frequently or examinations of Megalite silencers such as this? Sure, many times. And in your examination of uh, that particular device, with that particular baffle strike, are you able to tell what uh, type of weapon or caliber of weapon made that baffle strike? Not specifically what caliber or what type, but I can say that, in my opinion, looking at it, um, if you notice it's still a pretty round um, strike there, the, the hole is still more or less formed around. It's just pushed out a little bit. In my experience, typically if it's like from a high power rifle or something like that, the, the rifle will power on through and typically will, the 
the, where the, the baffles impact and the stru struck will be bent over or actually be another hole there. So I would expect, looking at this, no way to know for sure, I would expect this would have been a pistol caliber of some sort. If you're able to say so, would a uh, 22 long rifle bullet do that? Possibly. I, it may have been a, it's, it could be, may have been a little larger, and it depends on the bullet itself as well, what the composition of the bullet is, if it's completely lead or if it's jacketed, some kind of metal jacketed projectile may hold together better. But a lead, lead projectile will typically form itself to the, uh, the whatever it strikes and make it, you know, kind of mushroom out something that can make a bigger, bigger uh, deformation. Uh, so it would be fair to say that particular uh, device was damaged that when it arrived in your custody? Yes. And uh, if you're able to say so, based on your training experience, what type of damage uh, did it appear to suffer? Uh, you mean was beyond the baffle strike? Are you talking about the yeah, the melted? outside? Yeah, it kind of yeah. looks a little melted, doesn't it? Yeah, so it looks like it was in a fire. You can see this part. It uh, looks like the aluminum melted and was dripping down. Um, I'm thinking it was laying in the fire like this or whatever heat source there was. If you can look at the rear, there's like a half moon here, like it was sitting on top of something that was, you know, a cylinder of some sort. And it just, you know, melted into that and this part was dripping down. And you can see that the bottom of the device itself is uh, kind of melted away. Hey, did you have occasion to uh, perform an x-ray analysis on this particular device? I did. Mr. Wilson, if you would be so kind as to pull up State's Exhibit FFF by number six. And tell us what we're looking at here, Mr. Barlow. So can I, uh, can I point at the screen here? You may there I see this pointer here. Be a pointer yeah, right, right here. There okay. So this is the uh, this is the rear of the device. Um, here, you can see there's a how it's thicker in this area as far as lengthwise. It looks like a uh, the a cross section of a a uh, freeze plug, so it's wider. And here, what this looks like is a uh, one of the washer types. Uh, like the interior piece that's inside of this one it's laying over on its side you notice there's still a hole there and then there's another freeze plug here and uh, this is the melted portion on down at this end it looks like another uh, baffle that's laying on its side which you can actually see inside the hole there's another uh, it looks like a washer baffle laying over in there and then the, another freeze plug here um, if you remember, when I talked about ways you can make a silencer more efficient with the spaces between the baffles, here clearly there's spacing here and, and there may have been something here, I don't know, um, but there's a, a pretty good bit of space between here, between these baffles and this baffle. And if you remember I, I mentioned about having uh, the baffles fit tightly inside the, the, the uh, flashlight body or having the spacer material, what happens is when you have a first baffle strike, something like this, if they're not, they're not uh, compressed in there in such a manner so that they won't lay over, you can have a, just a slight baffle strike in the rear, perhaps back here. You have a slight baffle strike and then the, the bullet will yaw and may hit another. So this appears to be perhaps a you know, strike here and then it'll just kind of like be bouncing off of everything down through the device. That's a little, it's not really bouncing off of it, but you know, you see what I'm saying. And um, it appears to me, and what, that's what happened to this one, is either when it melted or when the, during the baffle strikes, the baffles laid over on their sides. And that's where you have uh, this one and this one come from. And do you have an ex uh, occasion to put any type of scope or uh, Anything like that inside to check out the interior of that? I did. I used the, the bore scope and looked at the inside of it. Okay, we're pulling up State's Exhibit uh, FFF7. And if you'd be so kind to tell us what we're looking at here. So these are, this is what I was just talking about. This, this is actually as a baffle laying sideways in the tube. Uh, you can see it over here. That's another view of it. Um, Right here is another view, and this just shows you 
uh, a freeze plug baffle and a washer together. There's a, a little space in there about like that between them. And you can see it in the in the rear device. This is how they were intended to be oriented. So you'd have a baffle and a uh, the washer pushed inside the baffle to make a little tiny um, expansion chamber in between those. I'm not sure that was terribly efficient, but to each his own. You discussed the uh, possibility of putting washers inside of uh, silencers earlier. Is that what you're referring to on this one? Yes. Okay. And Mr. Wilson, we go to triple F number eight, please. And tell us what we're looking at here, Mr. Burley. So this is the rear view of the uh, of the device. It shows the washer inside, and the uh, you can see the the baffle or freeze plug baffle, the outside portion of it, right at the rear end of the tube. Okay, it looks like. Did you have to uh, remove the rust to make further examination on this? So, knowing that, in my opinion, at the outset that these were freeze plug baffles um, on the inside of the freeze plug. Like I said, they're typically marked with the manufacturer and a part number. So in order to prove, if you will, my, uh, my, my uh, theory that those were in fact freeze plugs, I wanted to remove the, the washer from the rear. So if you look at the picture on the left, as, as received, that's how I got it. It's fairly corroded. Um, I didn't want to damage the, the device in any way maintain the integrity of the evidence. So I did use a, a wire brush and some solvent and cleaned around the outside edges a lot of the uh, the corrosion, rust, remove those so I could get to the uh, get to the washer and remove it from the device. Mr. Wilson, would you pull up FFF number nine, please? These are just step-by-step -step pictures of what I did. This is with the penetrant on there. I um, used the wire brush and cleaned everything off best I could and then if you uh, you see in the picture on the right those uh, the the blue outlines and the arrows show some of the the uh, markings that were on the, the actual freeze plug baffle underneath the washer and if we could have FFF 10 please and would you tell us what we're looking at here in regards to the rear washer Sure. So this is uh, this is the rear washer, as, as removed. You can see it still has a lot of corrosion on it, the, the penetrant there. If you notice at the bottom on the, the picture, you can see uh, well, it's got it marked that it's indication of a baffle strike. You see how the on the, the right picture, how the uh, the washer is kind of pushed forward in the same manner as the, the baffle in the front of the device, That's, which is indicative of a baffle strike. And during your analysis of uh, this particular device, did you ever compare it to uh, any actual mag lights? Do you have any uh, exemplars in uh, your possession at the ATF lab? Yes, I, I compared it with uh, actually the same size. And we're looking at State's Exhibit FFF11. Basically, is that, is that the type of mag light that the device you're holding was made out of? Yes. And just for the record, uh, how many uh, cells does that batteries does that mag light hold? It's a two D cell. It's pretty similar to something like this, though. Yes. Move on to State's Exhibit FFF twelve. And just tell us what we're looking at here. This is a comparison between the uh, the exemplar maglite tube that I have in my office compared with uh, the exhibit here. You can see that the uh, the knurling at the rear, or kind of in the center of, the, of my tube, is at the rear of the, this device. It has the knurling pattern around there, and uh, you can see where it was burned through here or melted, and here is. Uh, these are the threads that the head was grew on to. Let's move on to State's Exhibit FFF 13. And just for the record, the pictures here, you prepared these based that 
these pictures to illustrate your investigation and analysis of this device, did you not, sir? Correct. Can you just tell us what uh, these pictures indicate, if you would? So you can see that the, the switch hole, they're uh, comparable. Uh, notice how you have the beveled edge on the front and rear. You have it here as well. So that's just another indication that this was, in fact, at one time a maglite flashlight tube. Well, we looked at some freeze plugs earlier. We could have Stace Exhibit FFF14 up there. Maybe a bit, uh, bit bigger view for the jurors. Mm -hmm. uh, are those similar to the ones we looked at earlier? Yes. And it's basically if you uh, need to explain further, go right ahead. So you see the markings on the, the, the picture on the left shows the interior markings that I spoke of. Um, those are the, the so it's a 34.3 millimeter. Um, and it's got the other markings on there, UST, Made in USA. That's uh, how freeze plugs typically are marked by the manufacturer. And if we could have Stace Exhibit Triple F 15. And tell us what we're looking at here. So these are photos, the one on the picture on the left are, are pictures of the, the uh, interior of the first baffle after I took the, the uh, washer out. And you'll note that if you see it in, in real life, it, it actually is a lot clearer. But you can note that it says that you, you can see the made there, which is correspondent with the uh, made on the picture on the right. And the, the uh, three, for sure the digit number three over there where it's 34.3 millimeter. It just shows that, and you can see the MC at the end down there on the right side of the, the picture on the left. So it's clear that the, the markings on the picture on the left are you know, consistent with the markings of a, a freeze plug. Yeah, pull up State's Exhibit uh, FFF16 if you can. Tell us what we're looking at there. Are those uh, closer views of the markings you previously testified to? Correct. Those are uh, it's a better picture. And you have the picture on the right, the, the two pictures top and bottom. Are the you know the pictures from the exemplar and show how the, the markings are consistent. And with your exemplar, are those the exact type of freeze plugs that uh, you found uh, in that particular device? Yes. Can pull up uh, State's Exhibit Triple F Seventeen, please. Just tell us what we're looking at here. If you will. So the the picture on the left is is just a picture of the the diameter of the freeze plug out of the bag that the seal power over here. Um, that's how they typically come, will be in a bag of, of 10 or 12. Uh, and that one's 12 in the box, I think a lot of times they're 10. But uh, it's just showing the diameter of the, the, the plug itself. And if we take a look at uh, Stacy Exhibit FFF 18 piece. Is that further comparison with the uh, Plug diameters. So what I was looking at here was the a comparison between the exemplar freeze plug on the left and trying to get a, a accurate uh, diameter of the freeze plug in the device that, that suffered the baffle strike. So I was measuring as close as I could to the inside of the tube, but yet trying to get an accurate representation of the diameter of the uh, the baffle. And you can see what it's it's um. A six, seven, eight thousand saw. It's just you know, slightly, slightly smaller. That's a could be purely from corrosion or the difficulty in measuring something that's inside of another device. So and they're consistent with the same size. And so you were aware that uh, this was uh, recovered from a uh, well with water and everything. Yes. And, uh, let's move on to Stace Exhibit that FFF nineteen, if we could. <coughs> Just tell us what that is. That's just a picture of the a freeze plug and the mag light tube. It shows you how it fits inside. It's basically the same orientation that the one in, in this device is, but without the hole, clearly. Okay, basically kind of like a bigger version of basically this right. as to how it fits in. And show us Stace Exhibit FFF20, please. And what does this show? So this is a, a different, um, also, maglat silencer. Not from this case. This is a different one I use as an exemplar. 
This is a four cell device that has the freeze plugs installed. Um, you can see the picture on the left at the bottom, how it has the, the baffles installed in there. Um, you would call this a clip baffle where somebody would take and cut off a portion on the side to further um, cause the, 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 the gases flowing through the device. Some would say that makes it swirl more as, it, uh, as the gases pass through so that it would again slow down the, the transition, the travel of the gases through the device. But this just goes to show you that uh, this is a, a D cell, so same, same diameter and the same type of freeze plugs are used as, uh, as baffles. I want to take a look at State's Exhibit FFF21. You have, have another illustration of your exemplar mag light. Just tell us what that is. That, that, these are pictures from the inside with the bore scope that I mentioned. I just took a picture through the, through the device with the bore scope and it shows that there's a series of baffles through the device and they all correspond to the same, they're the same type and size as the, the ones we previously looked at. Um, the one, the picture on the bottom, it's a photo of how a freeze plug would typically be marked in the center in order to drill the, the center hole. You have to have a place to start at, so you want the hole to be in the center as close as possible. There are um, uh, fixtures that you can buy online or make and uh, go in, the freeze plug will actually fit inside that and it's set up with a, a hole so that when you drill the hole it's directly in the center of the freeze plug and you can buy uh, freeze plugs like this with the, the, the center marked it's like a starter hole you can buy them like that online uh, I wouldn't suggest it though. Okay. Would it be fair to say even though those are marketed you may be able to get on eBay and Amazon uh, if you assemble those into a homemade silencer are they legal? No. Let's just show the paper copies real quick of uh, Space Exhibit FFF2 to uh, FFF21. Uh, did you prepare those yourself? Uh, I did. And do those truly and accurately depict uh, the items you photographed in those? Yes, sir. And do they truly and accurately uh, represent what was illustrated on our view screens here as well? They used to be identical. In regard to State's Exhibit DDD 23 setting before you there, and based upon your training, your, uh, your experience in education in this field, and with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, do you have an opinion whether or not that item is a silencer? Yes, it was, it's a combination of parts. That was a, at one point in time, it was a complete silencer. And it's just, uh, it's clearly been damaged, but uh, one key point is that a silencer, especially the baffles, once you, once you create one, once you make one, the only way to, to remove it from regulation under the law is to totally destroy it. So a silencer tube would need to be cut in half section lengthwise, and typically it should be uh, pressed flat, squashed, uh, crushed, however you want to look at it. And the same thing with the baffles, where you can you can crush those, melt them, or uh, just destroy them in such a manner that they cannot be reused as a baffle. So, the baffle inside here, uh, this one specifically, and the the washer, you could pull those out, put it in another flashlight tube, and they're baffles again. So, the key thing with a, a firearm silencer is each part of a firearm silencer by itself is a firearm silencer under the law. So just, just this washer being used as a, as a baffle or the freeze plug with the hole drilled in it, it's no longer capable, capable of functioning as a freeze plug as it was originally designed. And it's been uh, remade into a, a silencer baffle. So now that baffle forevermore until it's destroyed is a firearm silencer in and of itself. You don't need the complete device, just one part is a silencer. Okay. So possession of that combination of parts once they've been assembled is illegal without uh, right typically without uh, proper documentation 
right? And obviously, to have one legally, it'd be fair to say you have to go through all kind of paperwork, fingerprints, pay, pay fees, and those type of things. Correct. And I want to go on for just a second. Uh, you've talked about um, homemade silencers, suppressors, uh, fire mufflers made out of magalites. Say I didn't like magalites, but I still wanted to silence my weapon. Could I use an oil filter for it? Yes. How would I do that? There are threaded adapters, the same as, as I mentioned, the adapters that you can use to put on a barrel that's not threaded. You can put an adapter on there, or you can thread a barrel, and then there's an, another subset, thread adapter, that's specific for uh, filters of different sizes. Typically, an automotive filter, spin-on kind, like when you get your oil changed, they're uh, in two sizes, and you can get an adapter that will fit each of those sizes separately, and so what you do is you would screw whichever adapter onto your firearm barrel and then the filter onto the adapter itself and you're done. Or they, they do make an adapter that has three different sizes on the same adapter. So you can fit the small size, the large size, and a three-quarter national pipe thread size onto the, the one adapter. So you put the adapter on, screw the, the oil filter onto the adapter, and you're done. How often do you see homemade silencers or suppressors made out of oil filters? Those are fairly common. Okay. And was uh, back up to mag lights. How uh, how well do they work, and how uh, quiet can they make a firearm? A mag light. So the remember the tube creates the expansion chamber. The bigger the expansion chamber is, the better it works, the more efficient it is. Just like you would expect, like a muffler on a semi. You know, you see the big stack, it works pretty well for a semi-truck. Where if you put a muffler for an automobile on a semi-truck, it wouldn't work nearly as well. So it's a lot smaller due to the volume. It won't contain the volume. So the w if, depends on how you design your mag light. You can go with the, we saw the picture before with the four cell. It's a lot bigger. And then the design on the inside, the features and characteristics, how many spacers you put in between each baffle, how many baffles you put in, how big the hole is, all those play a, a different part in it. But it's uh, it's been my experience that a maglite flashlight uh, silencer, they typically can run 25, say about 25 decibel reduction, or maybe even more, some less, depending on what the, the person who made it, how they designed it, their particular uh, design of the interior features. But they are quite, uh, they're quite efficient. As far as a uh, oil filter silencer suppressor, can you get it? Can you get one of those? Uh, you put one together and not get caught uh, where it will match the efficiency of a maglite. They, they may be close, but probably not as good. Usually, in, in my experience, I've looked at uh, the the measurements taken with the the silencer equipment. I looked at a few of those, and and you know you can get uh, typically a spin-on filter. It's about this big to some of the larger ones are about this big so again the size of the the expansion chamber makes a difference along with whatever size cartridge is of the, the firearms chambered in that you're going to be firing through there a center fire rifle a high power rifle clearly makes more gas so it would need a bigger expansion chamber whereas a 22 long rifle wouldn't need much space because it doesn't create a lot of, a lot of gas to flow through so the differences between those, um, all these different factors make a make a, a difference whenever you're trying to determine what your what your goal is, how quiet you want it to be. And a uh, a spin-on filter is usually, depending on what you put on, between 10 to 20 decibel reduction. I haven't seen one that works as well as a maglite flashlight, depending on the size. So a larger maglite will work better than a uh, filter. A spin on filter, but they're fairly comparable. Have you ever run across any Wix filters? Yes. This is something like a weird question. You're familiar with a Wix model uh, 33960? I've heard of those. I mean, there's a lot of different, yeah, different variations. Okay. And can pretty much any oil filter, like that would fit a pickup truck, car, semi, tractor, uh, 
somebody knows what they're doing, can they turn that into a suppressor or silencer? Absolutely. Uh, any size will work. Yeah. And say, uh, say I don't want to use a pistol, say I want to silence my rifle. I've got something, a 7.62 by uh, 39 millimeter, yeah, something like that. Um, what kind of homemade silencer would I want to put on that to quiet it down? Mm, if I was if I was building one, I would I would probably go with the maglite, just because I can then uh, choose how I want the, the the interior parts and pieces to be, as far as the the difference the distance between each one, the spaces between the baffles and everything. But the easiest, fastest, and easiest clearly would be the uh, the a spin on filter. And obviously, you're familiar with various types of firearms. Yes. And are there uh, kits, adapters, things like that, or threaded barrels out there that say I could put on my rifle or my pistol if I didn't want to have to like use a tap and die or something like that? Yes. Okay, are they pretty easy easy to come by? Now, there's a quite a few uh, threaded barrels out there for a variety of firearms, especially uh, pistols. Um, a lot of those pistols typically don't come with a threaded barrel on the end. Um, but there are a lot of aftermarket barrels for, for pistols. Okay. So if I wanted a, uh, say a, a, I bought like a Glock 19 or a 1911, so I get a nice Kimber or Colt or something like that, would uh, okay, would I have to go out? Would it be pretty easy for me to get a, a threaded barrel to put on it? Yes. Can you buy those over the Internet? Yes. But have you take a look at that? document for me. Have you look at uh, the state's exhibits DB1, DB2, I'm sorry, DDB1, DDB2, and DDB3. Okay. Yeah, I follow that. We have gone through a lot of exhibits. For the record, it is uh, DDB1. If, if uh, we're going to be a while, should we take a break now? Um, yeah. Probably wouldn't hurt. Probably wouldn't hurt. I'm not. I don't have too much longer to really cross examination. Uh, let's take a 15 minute break, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be in recess until 3:30. At that time, we can assemble at the jury room to be brought up by uh, officers of the court. During the break, you're not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Not to permit anyone to discuss this.
Commission of Witnesses. Thank you, Your Honor. Hey, Mr. Barlow, you testified earlier that a, uh, another firearms officer had looked at this uh, silencer or suppressor first. Would that have been an Elizabeth Gillis? Yes. If I may, uh, what happened with Elizabeth, with Elizabeth Gillis? No, uh, she's deceased. Okay. And I think someone indicated to us she may have been on terminal leave right after the, right after the analysis as well. Yes. Okay. And if you're able to say, pursuant to your training, experience, and education, uh, are you familiar with the term uh, stippling? Stippling, yes. What is that? Well, two kinds of stippling that I know of. Um, there's a stippling as the grip of a firearm, you know, the, the surface of it. And I guess you're you're talking about stippling as far as the yeah, uh, gunpowder, uh, right, that right. type of stippling. Yes. And would would uh, We've had coroners in talking about stippling earlier in the case. Would uh, how would having a suppressor on the end of the, of a firearm affect uh, you know, the gases coming out and the ability to uh, you know, put the stippling on a uh, person or other type of target? A firearm silencer. Uh, we talked about whatever comes out of the gun barrel will go into and through the silencer before it exits the front of the silencer. And inevitably, some of the particles and whatnot that comes out of the barrel will be captured and retained inside the device. So not necessarily everything that a gun would typically discharge will be discharged into the atmosphere with a silencer installed. Say if I'm looking at the you know, stippling on a victim or some, other, some type of other target, would a uh, suppressor make it harder to... Uh, determine a distance gun, a gun's fired at? I would say that if you didn't know whether the, the firearm had a silencer or not on it, it clearly that would probably skew the, uh, the determination because you wouldn't know, you would appear that there was less, less stippling, less debris than there would be, you would expect there to be from a firearm that's not silenced. So clearly silenced and not silenced would be different. And would a uh, silencer, or suppressor, suppressor, or firearm muffler affect the accuracy of any particular firearm? They they can, uh, in different in different ways. Uh, clearly, if you have a baffle strike, that'll be an issue. But some some silencers, and so the industry works really hard to make that a non-issue. Uh, some silencers, if you get a really nice one. They, they claim not to uh, uh, affect the point of impact, which is where you're going to hit if you're aiming at a certain place. The bullet will actually go there. Um, and other times, just depending on a variety of factors, that, that may in fact uh, affect the, the point of impact if you attach a silencer to it. Okay. You, also, you just indicated that uh, the, the industry was aware of that. By industry, so you mean the legitimate legal suppressor manufacturers? Yes, yeah, so the licensed uh, firearm silencer manufacturers. Yeah, so like Gemtech or like Surefire used to make them? Correct. Like Surefire, that. yes, okay. or another. Not the, the build it in your garage, make it out of Chinese parts mm -hmm. illegally uh, type of group on that then? Now you can, you, you know, you just do the best you can with what you have, I guess. Okay. Let's just say I've just bought a just bought a firearm. I mean, it, that's really loud. Why would I? Why would I want a uh, want to have a suppressor or silencer on? Uh, one of the uh, one of the main reasons people will want a silencer is clearly to make it not as loud. So you know, shooting a firearm. Um, Hair protection is, is key. Uh, it's a if you shoot a firearm a lot more and more times, it's going to impact your, your hearing and it's a cumulative effect. It's not once or twice here and there. A lot of people uh, when they go to the range or practice, they'll put on hearing protection. But if you go hunting, you, you go out deer hunting, you're probably not going to be wearing hearing protection. So even if you shoot one time, two or three times, that's going to impact your hearing. So with a with a, um, a silencer attached, uh, and that particular instance not only will it it uh, keep you from having as much exposure to noise but also for, from the hunting aspect um, you may not spook the game uh, you shoot you miss 
and it's, you know, a deer may or may not run depending on what noise they hear as an example. But in theory, if it's a, a lot quieter noise than a loud one, they may look around and try to figure out what's going on before they run off and you give you a, a, an opportunity for a second shot. Um, there's other, other reasons why. I mean, if you'd like me to elaborate. If you would, please. Uh, military functions or, or uh, even perhaps law enforcement as well. Uh, it's one of the reasons why they, they have a particular silencer. It was introduced, and it's not new or novel. It's been around a long time in, in wartime and whatnot. Um, they had a well rod a long time ago. It was a, like a single shot. Uh, it was integrally suppressed, means it's always suppressed. Uh, things like that are for sensory elimination. So if you're, you have an objective you want to take, and you, there's you know one one door, and there's a guard standing outside the door, but you want to get your whole team in there before you're discovered, or at, it, maybe not at all, but you got to go past the door where the guard's standing. If you can get close enough with a silenced firearm, basically you kill the guard and then move in and, and on to your objective without anybody being any the wiser. <coughs> um, the, the game issue I talked about is, as far as uh, being able to, to hunt and not spook the game. Um, there's also the, the possibility, or well, it's not a possibility, it's a, it's a fact, if you're, if you're not having to wear earmuffs and everything like that, whenever you're doing anything tactical or you're, you want to be able to communicate with somebody while you're doing what it is you're doing, you don't want to be, you know, if you're shooting guns that are unsilenced, it's going to be loud. When you do that, if you if you ever shot one before, you you know you get the ringing in the ears. It's loud. You know you're not hearing as well as you used to. While that's going on, then you may miss the communication with a team member, something like that. So it's easier to hear radios. Um, my experience in the military, if you're not communicating, you're really behind the power curve. You need to be able to hear and uh, reply. So that's another good reason to have a, uh, a firearm silencer. See, basically, if you talk about the you know, military um, you know, personnel using them to take out sentries without getting caught. Right. Basically, if you uh, so if you shoot someone in the middle of the night or something like that, that would attract attention without a suppressor, would it not? So if it's if it's allowed, yeah, gunshot, then clearly everybody would, especially in wartime or whatever, yeah, people are going to hear it. And they're going to be like, hey, that, that sounded kind of like a gun. And, you know, they, they would then investigate or be alerted to the fact of something's going on that's out of the norm. And you, you, if you want to be, you know, under the radar, so to speak, you don't want anybody to be alerted to your presence. If, uh, how about uh, if for some reason I want to fire my weapon inside, would a suppressor help me do that without... Uh, both blowing my ears out and uh, attracting attention to everyone else in the structure. Sir, so whatever happens outside that, that makes it quieter works the same on the inside, and and inside it would be you know clearly a lot louder in a smaller confined space than outside in atmosphere. So yeah, it would be uh, you know functional for that. In your experience, and obviously you've been in the military, the military teams use these basically to avoid detection, do they not? Correct. Primarily. And if you don't mind, let me have you uh, look at some paperwork for us. I'm going to give you a copy. And what we're looking at, for the record, uh, I'll go slow on these, BDB1, BDB2, and BDB3. Yes, sir. Sure. See, this was a online prepared by one of our analysts at BCI. <laughs> I just want you to look at the, uh, in the bottom in the left corner there for February 26, 2016. Um, what is a uh, Colt Umarex 1911 22 LR 1 half by 28 TPI thread adapter with thread protector? So what that is, is as we talked about earlier, the the thread adapter that goes on the barrel of the gun that you would then attach the silencer to. Uh, that's basically what this is. It's a it's an adapter you can screw on uh, the uh, Colt Umarex 1911-22. If, if you're familiar with it, the, the, the Colt 1911 was a 45 caliber ACP pistol uh, from 
you know, primarily they started in World War II. Um, we used them when I was in the Navy. We still had those. Um, but the Umarex version is a 22 long rifle version of the same gun. It looks the same, but it's a 22 long rifle. And this is adapter, it's just so you can screw it on the barrel and then attach a muzzle device with half 28 threads to it. Okay. With, uh, with, the, uh, with 28 threads, uh, would that be something in common use for, say, a particular caliber? Say, if I wanted to suppress my. Uh, Colt 19, 22 caliber 1911. Would I use that particular diameter to do it? So the the the, the half 28 uh, threads is the probably argu arguably the most common thread size for firearms today. Um, usually, as a general rule, it's a, a caliber that's 22 caliber or you know a little bit larger, maybe a little smaller, 17 HMR or something like that. But the two mainstream sizes of, of firearms that are usually attached in this method with a, with a silencer are the, the half 28 and 5.8 24. Rule of thumb, it's a, the AR-15 type is a half 28 and then the larger uh, AR-10 style, that's a 30 caliber, a little bit larger uh, board diameter, is the 5.8 24. I'd like to look at the uh Entry for February 28, 2016. Uh, does anything about that ring about to you? I uh, purchased for um, the uh, freeze plugs, the Dorman freeze plugs. That one. And those are similar to what you previously showed us and testified to. That's what. Uh, that's yeah. They're freeze plugs. That's what they're. I'd like to move uh, on down to the uh, 29th. There's two of these there. Uh, are you familiar with a? Uh, great light, high intensity aluminum flashlight? Yes. And are they similar to a mag light? So that they are similar, but uh, it's just a little bit lower quality. Uh, not as robust as a, uh, as a mag light is. Okay, say uh, yeah, for some reason I can't get a mag light and yeah, I don't have enough money to get the real thing or anything. Could I use one of those to uh, make a suppressor just like I could with a mag light? You, you could. Uh, maybe it might take a, a different size freeze plug, perhaps, and it may be exactly the same. Um, and it depends on the thread pitches of the caps. You could use maybe perhaps the, uh, the same end caps as you can buy for a, a, a mag light, or it may be a different size. I'm not sure about that, so you may have to actually drill and thread the flashlight end cap itself to fit on the barrel or fabricate some kind of an adapter. Be fair to say that the uh, great lights are basically the, uh, some type of uh, mag light knockoff at a lower price. That's exactly what it is. I'd like to take a look uh, again, February 29th up top there. Uh, in Drill America Series High Speed Steel Extra Long Drill Bit, Black Oxide Finish, um, Spiral Flute, 118 degrees conventional uh, point. Um, is there anything I could do with that if I decided I wanted to uh, make a uh, homemade silencer or suppressor? Is it? <laughs> this is uh, speculation, but... In your training experience, have you seen people, uh, seen uh, homemade silencers or suppressors where anyone's taken a uh, drill bit as opposed to a uh, drill press or anything really fancy? Yes, yes. You say you could use these the drill bits would be useful for drilling a hole in anything or the freeze plugs in this particular case. These are extremely long drill bits. I think they're about like this long so it's typically a drill bit you know is about this long. You have more control over it but uh, these are exceptionally long compared to a standard drill bit. They'd be longer than say a uh, Two cell mag light? Probably about the same size, or maybe, yeah, a little bit longer. I'd like to take you to uh, March 1st up on uh, top there. Uh, could you tell us what a half by 28 CS um, hex die is and what I would want to use it for? So, again, the, the half 28 thread pitch key, uh, arguably the most common firearm barrel thread pitch 
you have a, a threaded barrel. Most, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the firearm silencers are threaded to that size because the AR barrel, that's what it is. A lot of people use uh, the silencers on a, the direct threaded to the <coughs> AR barrel. So with this die, you could use it to cut uh, mill threads on the firearm barrel so that, you know, correspondingly you could attach something to it that you, you know, needed mill threads to attach to. Okay. How about the uh, other entry for March 1st of 2016? The Napa Trading Company, uh, one half uh, by 28 um, plug tap. That's the that's the tap size, the same same uh, half 28 uh, thread pitch size and pitch. You would use that then. So let's say for instance you're making a a uh, silencer from the maglight or a different brand flashlight that you didn't have the, the adapter for that's already threaded, you can drill the hole uh, and then use this to uh, cut the threads so that it would then fit onto a gun barrel or whatever else that was half 28 thread size. Look at State's Exhibit uh, BBB2 if I could. Second. Hey, and looking up top, uh, March second, twenty sixteen, on the left. But, uh, what is a uh, twenty-seven by uh, by sixty-four times eighteen HSS extra long drill bit? That's similar to what you previously testified to. Yeah, so it's a, another drill bit, different size. Um, 2764, so I think I did the math on it, it comes up to like 0.42 inches, if I did it correctly. So it's a little short of half an inch. Yeah, I'll direct your attention uh, right down from uh, the other March 2nd entry. And this uses an interesting term. This is a uh, Magalite D-cell solvent trap combo. Half by 28 thread adapter, a light bulb in gap, like mm -hmm. Tyka Industries. And what uh, have you heard the term solvent trap before? I have. Where have you heard the term solvent trap? No, uh, it's a, it's an industry term. Um, typically, what it is, it's a what it is. It's a firearm silencer that's being marketed as a solvent trap to skirt the laws and some people mark it as a kit to build their own silencer from uh, not legal as, as far as the kit itself as, as a solvent trap they're typically not legal ATF has never approved any device marketed as a solvent trap as an actual solvent trap and not a silencer so it's it's a common usage of the term as a solvent trap to to sell items to people who are intending to make silencers. With the term solvent trap, um, it's supposed to mean like you catch your uh, like break free or other type of gun cleaning oil and stuff coming out the end? Allegedly. Okay. Does anyone actually ever do that in real life? I have never seen it happen. And again, uh, that particular kid, if I wanted to make a Suppressor out of a maglite would that help me do it? So that that's exactly what these are intended for. It's uh, it's the rear end cap we looked at earlier. It's a rear end cap that fits inside the um, maglite tube. It's designed to the same thread, so it just screws right on. It has half 28 threads in the rear, so it attaches to an, an, a firearm barrel that's so threaded. And then the front cap is also designed to screw onto the front end of a mag light silencer and remembering that the, the rear is, is internally threaded the front is externally threaded so it's a kind of an odd combination if you're building a silencer usually you'll have the threads will be internal on both ends but that's the way a mag light is made so they sell these uh these, this set of end caps so you just screw the front end cap over the where the head goes on the flashlight um usually they're marked in the center 
so you can follow that mark and drill the hole directly in the center so you're not you know you won't be off and you know have the potential for a baffle strike and there are uh, the hole in the front you have to drill so again you want the hole to be as close to the size of the, the bullet you're using on the firearm you're using so what you can do with these is you can customize basically that's what it is you're customizing the end cap size hole to a 30 caliber 45 caliber or 22 caliber and it's easier for the manufacturers to make these without a hole uh, they're, they're trying to skirt the law which it's that's not correct but the, the advantage to it is they only have to make one kind of cap over and over again there's no no different models and then the end user just drills the hole the size they want hey, if you don't mind mr barlow have you check out states exhibit bdb3 have you looked at the march 17th entry and what are we looking at there so this is a looks like it's a tap and die set let me see and tap and die so this is this is a set tap and die as we saw the other ones were half 28 where it's one's the die one's tap this is a set um, it's for 9 16 24 and I'm not a hundred percent certain but I believe there are some manufacturers that will use 924 threads on nine millimeters but I'm not positive about that okay. and sir based on your training edu uh, education experience and obviously any one like say if I buy drill bits obviously uh, that wouldn't suggest anything in itself would it no okay. say if I buy we'll just start beginning if I buy a thread it in for my barrel freeze plugs two knockoff mag lights long uh, drill bits uh, tap and dies more long drill bits a solvent trap that you've explained and more uh, tap and dies based on your training experience and education with the ATF does that suggest uh, anything that I'm doing with those so to me it would um, the combination of all these things together like like I said as far as the freeze plugs by themselves it's just a freeze plug the drill bits people use drill bits all the time and, and a lot of people have flashlights to see in the dark with um, what gives me pause is when you get to the the uh, solvent trap combo front and rear end caps those are purpose-built uh, to use on mag light flashlights and I don't know if anybody uses those that are not building a silencer I mean, it's theoretically possible but uh, and th that along with the the threaded adapter all these parts in combination to me say somebody's building a firearm silencer that would be my my estimate your honor I have no further questions for Mr. Barlett Step down. We have no further witnesses stated. Well, this might be a good time in. All right, it's, it's uh, almost four o'clock on the nose, about one after or something like that. So we will be recessing for the day, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the jury, you'll be going home. Again, the instruction is not to discuss uh, this case among yourselves or with anyone else, not to permit anyone to discuss this case with you or in your presence, not to form or express an opinion concerning this case until it's finally submitted to you for deliberation and verdict. Do not do any research, uh, either as to the facts or as to the law uh, uh, of this case from any source at all. Um, and uh, do not read, listen to, or view any reports or accounts of this case from any source at all. And that would include, of course, newspapers, radio, and television, but would also include uh, Facebook, uh, social media sites, any internet uh, sites, any source at all. Refrain from all of that and have no contact with uh, participants in the trial, including parties, counsel, and witnesses. 
Now, is there anything further from either the state or the defense before we recess for the day? We got nothing, Your Honor. <laughs> All right. We are in recess until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. At that time, assemble at the jury room. You'll be brought up by court personnel. Please leave your notepads on your seats and wear your badges.